Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's budget hearing. My name is Mark Jonai, and I am the chair of the Council's Committee on Small Business Services. We're also joined at the moment by Councilman Bill Perkins. Today we'll be hearing from the Department of Small Business Services on their fiscal 2019 preliminary budget that totals $172.2 million. I share that the speaker's vision in ensuring that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to New Yorkers. Hence, as chair of the Council Small Business Committee, I will continue to push for accountability and accuracy and ensure that the budget reflects the needs and interests of the city. The Department of Small Business Services fiscal 2019 preliminary budget totals $172.2 million, which includes $29.3 million for personal services to support 362 full-time employees. The Department's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget is $43.9 million, or 20 percent less than the fiscal 2018 adopted budget of $216.5 million. I would like the Commissioner to provide the reasons for this decrease in the baseline budget and the programs that will be impacted due to the decrease. Additionally, I would like the Commissioner to explain the impending increases that we may see in the executive budget in May and the November plan or the readjustment. One concern I have in this headcount for the agency, the fiscal 2019 preliminary plan has 362 full-time positions in fiscal 2018 and 2019. However, the agency's actual headcount every month in fiscal 2018 has been almost 90 less than what is in the plan. I would like to hear from SBS today the reason why the agency consistently, without fail, has such a high vacancy rate and whether these funds can be redistributed to programs that actually help SBS fulfill its mission to help New Yorkers, small businesses grow and prosper. Other areas I'm hopeful to hear from the Commissioner on include new needs reflected in the budget, such as the Cooney Tech Initiative, School Bus Grant Program, Construction Safety Training Initiative, and Apprentice NYC Initiative. I'd like the Commissioner to share with us how the agency plans to meet the Mayor's 5% efficiency savings targeted in the executive budget and the City's goal to have 30% of the dollar value of City contracts go to certified MWBEs by 2021, when we are currently only at 12%. I want to learn more about the work that bids are doing in the community and the other programs such as Avenue NYC that assists in neighborhood development and communities. As the speaker highlighted at the OMB hearing, it is essential that the budget that we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and interests of the council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of this process, and I expect that the SBS will be responsive to the questions and concerns of council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure the fiscal 2019 adopted budget meets the goals that the Council has set out. I'd like to thank the Commissioner Bishop for coming here today and testifying. I'd like to thank the SBS staff who have consistently been responsive to our many requests. We would not be able to analyze the City's budget at such a detailed level without their cooperation. So thank you. I'd like to also thank both my staff and the staff of the Finance Division for their help in preparing this hearing. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai and the members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Greg Bishop. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City. I'm sorry. Sorry, just really quick, Commissioner. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth before this committee today and respond honestly to council members' questions? I always speak the truth. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> I'm joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon and my senior leadership team. I would like to begin by welcoming the new members of this committee and I look forward to continuing our important work together. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I want, to update, I want to share an update on our efforts over the last year to strengthen the city's support for job seekers, small businesses, and commercial corridors across the city. 
After my testimony, I'm happy to take your questions. First, I'd like to give you an overview of our agency budget. From there, I'll delve into the services made possible through this funding. SBS FY19 preliminary budget is $172.7 million with a headcount of 362 employees. The preliminary budget includes pass-through funding for other financial needs within gov city government. This funding is not spent or managed by SBS, but is used as a conduit funding for other city entities. Of the $172.7 million, 36% or $61.3 million is pass-through funding, which includes $22.2 million for New York City Economic Development Corporation, $21.2 million for New York City and Company, and $16.5 million for Governor's Island, and $1.4 million for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The remaining $111.4 million, or 64% of the FY19 preliminary budget, is allocated for SBS's program. This funding supports SBS mission of economically empowering New Yorkers through our employment, business, and neighborhood services. As the city's advocate for small businesses, SBS is committed to ensuring that businesses are aware of and can easily connect to our services no matter where they are in our city. Businesses can access our range of free services through our seven NYC business solution centers throughout the five boroughs. Job seekers can receive free recruitment and training resources through our 21 Workforce One career centers. SBS also invests in mass marketing through ad campaigns, social media, email blasts, radio, and local and ethnic press. We understand that it's not always easy for business owners to come to us, so we also bring our resources directly to their doorsteps. Through the council-funded Chamber on the Go initiative, trained business specialists canvas commercial corridors to connect business owners with our services. SBS also recently launched our mobile outreach unit, an additional resource equipped to serve New Yorkers on-site in their neighborhoods. The mobile outreach unit features classroom space and multimedia capabilities, so we are able to deliver routine and emergency services on-site quickly. We've reached over 8,000 businesses through these services. Additionally, SBS works closely with community partners to get the word out about our services. We look forward to partnering with this committee to reach New Yorkers across the city. Small businesses are essential to the local economy and character of our neighborhoods. They provide opportunities for individuals to strengthen their own economic security and provide jobs for members of their communities. I grew up with my grandmother in Grenada who supported our household as a woman entrepreneur. So I understand firsthand how business ownership can empower a family and support greater economic opportunity for future generations. This personal experience is fundamental to my vision for SBS and I'm proud to work every day towards our mission to help New York City entrepreneurs start, operate, and grow their business. As I previously mentioned, SBS operates a network of seven NYC business solution centers that provide free high quality services. These centers, which are the core of our business support, offer services including access to capital, MWB certification, navigating government regulations, and connecting to qualified talent. To provide assistance to industrial and manufacturing businesses, SBS contracts with nine industrial business service providers, IBSPs. In FY17, the IBSPs connected more than 550 businesses to nearly 1,000 services. SBS is also working to identify and mitigate common concerns of small businesses. With support from more than 15 city agencies, SBS leads Mayor de Blasio's Small Business First Initiative, a multi-agency collaboration to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses. The city gathered input from hundreds of business owners to better understand areas of the city that needed improvement, which streamlining the delivery of critical information to businesses by creating an online portal where businesses can see all of their interactions with different city agencies in one place. Through our Small Business Support Center in Queens, the first one-stop licensing and permitting cent office that houses multiple city agencies in one building, we have provided over 70,000 services. We have also provided more than 2,600 on-site consultations through our compliance advisors, experts from regulatory agencies who educate business owners on how to prevent costly fines and penalties. Many businesses struggle to adapt to changes in the business environment. These challenges range from macroeconomic trends like the rise of e-commerce to neighborhood dynamics like rent speculation. The underlying causes of these changes are complex and vary from neighborhood to neighborhood, corridor to corridor, and property to property. But SBS is committed to providing businesses with the tools they need to adapt. To support businesses that are facing issues with their lease, we provide free legal assistance through our commercial lease assistance program. 
Businesses can work one-on-one -on -one with attorneys to review lease renewal terms, negotiate with their landlord, and even prepare court papers and motions when litigation cannot be avoided. A major focus of our work is ensuring our program is accessible to all New Yorkers, including women and immigrant entrepreneurs. In 2015, SBS launched WeNYC, a major initiative to address the entrepreneurship gender gap with a focus on underserved communities. Through extensive research and engagement with more than 1,500 women entrepreneurs, we developed a series of programs to address the most common challenges women business owners face. This includes the recently launched We Fund Crowd, a city-led crowdfunding program that helps women entrepreneurs access, access affordable capital and start businesses. Through our partnership with Kiva, women entrepreneurs can apply for crowdfunded loans up to $10,000, and the city will contribute the first 10% of their loan request. To support immigrant entrepreneurs, we released a guide offering step-by-step -step advice for immigrant entrepreneurs. Building Your Business in New York City, a Guide for Immigrant Entrepreneurs is available in seven languages and includes advice on topics such as signing a commercial lease, navigating government, and understanding the rights of immigrant New Yorkers. Along with our support of small businesses, SBS also plays a key role in the city's minority and women-owned business enterprise program. The MWB program aims to support the growth of minority and women-owned businesses through city procurement and ensure our vendors reflect the diversity of our city. SBS certifies MWBEs and provides essential capacity building services and technical assistance to ensure that they can compete for and execute city contracts. This administration has made major investments into the MWB program and has set ambitious goals to support MWBs, including certifying 9,000 MWBs by 2019. To achieve this, SBS has streamlined our application process while maintaining the integrity of the program. Through the support and investment of this administration, we, will, we are seeing the results. At the end of quarter one of FY18, SBS has certified 5,271 MWBs, representing a nearly 45% increase uh, during this administration. SBS also offers a number of capacity building programs and technical assistance resources designed for MWBEs. Cash flow is often an issue for companies working on city projects, particularly for MWBs, so the administration created a contract financing loan fund. This $10 million revolving fund offers low interest loans of up to half a million dollars capped at a 3% interest rate. MWBs also have difficulty receiving surety bonds for con construction contracts. In January, we launched the $10 million bond collateral assistance fund to allow MWBs and small businesses to access up to half a million dollars in collateral assistance. Beyond supporting MWBs in contracting, SBS also offers targeted programs to help MWBs grow their business. Programs like Strategic Steps for Growth and Education Program in partnership with NYU, SBS helps MWBs define and execute a strategic growth action plan to help stimulate revenue and job growth. Since the launch of the program, SBS has graduated more than 100 MWBs. By investing in the MWB program and the companies themselves, the city is leveraging its spending power to ensure diversity in procurement. In line with the Mayor's Career Pathways Strategic Plan, a roadmap to create a more inclusive workforce, SBS is responsible for helping New Yorkers find jobs by connecting job seekers to employers and local residents to industry-informed training. Through our network of 21 Workforce One Career Centers, SBS provides recruitment expertise, industry knowledge, and skill bu building workshops to match candidates to jobs. Annually, we successfully connect more than 25,000 New Yorkers with quality employment and nearly 4,000 New Yorkers with the training needed to advance their careers. To ensure job seekers are connected to good paying jobs, this administration inst instituted a job quality policy which requires businesses receiving free recruitment services through our Workforce One Career Centers to hire employees for full-time positions or pay at least the living wage, currently at $13.65 per hour. As a result, we've seen a significant increase in the percentage of New Yorkers connected to full-time work, from about 45% in 2014 up to around 80% in 2017. SBS also offers a number of training that are designed to meet employers' needs identified through our industry partnerships. These trainings are designed to help low-income New Yorkers gain access to living wage jobs that they would otherwise struggle to find and secure. We have expanded our industry partnerships in technology and healthcare sectors and have launched partnerships in the food and beverage service, construction, and industrial and manufacturing sectors. 
The goal of these industry partnerships is not only to connect New Yorkers to employment, but also to build a long-term sustainable connection between employers and the organizations that teach individuals the skills that are needed to enter and advance in the New York City job market. SBS plays a role in Mayor de Blasio's New York Works Plan, a series of 25 initiatives developed to create 100,000 jobs with good wages over the coming decade. In FY17, we announced the CUNY 2X Tech Initiative to double the number of City University of New York students graduating annually with a tech-related bachelor's degree by the year 2022. The five-year, $20 million CUNY 2X Tech Initiative brings together CUNY colleges and the major employers to expand access to quality tech careers and meet industry needs. SBS will also launch a Apprentice NYC, a new employer partnership model that will provide New Yorkers with good jobs in sectors that include tech, healthcare, and industrial and manufacturing. SBS is also working with the Department of Buildings and the Mayor's Office to provide construction safety training for those who do not have access. With an investment of $18.7 in FY17, we are developing a program to provide day laborers, employees of small businesses and MWBs, and new en en entrants into the construction industry with the construction safety training recommended by the Site Safety Training Task Force. The expertise of local underground partners is essential to tackling the unique challenges faced by New York City's diverse neighborhoods and business communities. SBS oversees the largest network of business improvement districts in the country, with 75 bids delivering more than $147 million in services to over 93,000 businesses throughout the five boroughs. Not only does SBS provide technical assistance, grant opportunities, and capacity building services to bids, but this network also provides a direct connection between neighborhood small businesses and our agency. We are proud that this administration has led an increase in smaller bids located in outer boroughs, giving business communities across the city an opportunity to raise their collective voice. We recently celebrated the creation of the city's 75th bid, the Morris Park bid, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, Chair Jonai, uh, because it's in your district. Uh, we'll soon release our annual bid trends report, which highlights the tremendous impact bids have on our neighborhoods across the city. SBS is committed to working with community partners to identify local commercial district needs and plan targeted solutions. One tool for gaining this understanding is through our commercial district needs assessments, or CDNAs. So far, we have published seven CDNAs in downtown Flushing, downtown Staten Island, East Harlem, East New York, Inwood, Jerome Avenue, and Coney Island. Conducted in partnership with local community organizations, CDNAs identify the strengths, challenges, and opportunities within a commercial corridor. This tool provides valuable information about the needs of local business owners and commercial corridors and gives community organizations a framework to plan investments aimed at strengthening neighborhoods and businesses. SBS also provides financial support to strengthen and revitalize commercial districts through our grant programs. With Neighborhood 360 community-based organizations in six neighborhoods were awarded approximately $8.5 million in funding over the next three years to develop and staff revitalization projects that address needs identified in the CDNAs. Projects pertaining to merchant organizing, public programming, streetscape enhancements, business development, and other quality of life improvements are ongoing in each of these neighborhoods. To further support small businesses and neighborhoods, SBS provides community-based organizations with capacity building services, including workshops, legal assistance, design assistance, leadership development, and nonprofit management coaching. To address additional staff capacity challenges, our Neighborhood 360 Fellows Program pairs 10 neighborhood development professionals with 10 community-based organizations. The fellows are paid, full-time professionals, community, organi community organizers, or urban planners. The program provides organizations with dedicated support for commercial revitalization projects and builds a pipeline of talent in neighborhood development. For example, in Chinatown, the FY17 Neighborhood 360 Fellow created and implemented a communications plan to increase awareness of SBS business preparedness and resiliency program among Chinatown-based business owners. Her efforts resulted in 30 new applications resulting in the potential for more than $90,000 in grants to these small business owners. After wrapping up two successful cohorts, SBS is excited to launch our third cohort, which with placements at organizations in every borough this spring. Together, SBS and our community partners are supporting vibrant neighborhoods where, neighborhood, where New Yorkers can shop, work, and live. We look forward to working with council in the year ahead. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner.
one of the most important part of the hearings like this um, is that government leaders get a chance to hear directly from the public on the issues that impact their lives. Commissioner, do you plan on staying for the remainder of the hearings to hear those things that impact our businesses and community leaders? So we, I have uh, staff that I, I'm not able to stay um, because I have a, a personal commitment, um, uh, but certainly I have a whole team here that will be here. And in previous hearings, uh, whatever the public has said has come back to the, our agency, we, we have addressed it. Great, thank you for that. But I encourage you to stay as long as you can. For everyday New Yorkers who have their own busy lives, the budget process may seem a bit dense and arcane. So why don't we start with some of the basics? Why we're all here today? What is the SBS and what is its missions? In particular, what is the mission of the agency? So our agency is complex because we have uh, three areas that we work in, but uh, in short, our job is to create economic opportunity uh, for New Yorkers. And we do that in multiple ways. One is obviously we talked about the, su the support uh, that we provide small businesses, so we help businesses start, expand, and operate. A lot of our services are focused on pre-startups, startups, and operating businesses. Uh, we also help job seekers, so New Yorkers who are looking uh, to advance their career either uh, in training, in new skill sets, uh, we provide a lot, and a lot of our investments are actually in training, uh, or we actually help New Yorkers find jobs. Uh, so our model is unique because we work with the private sector. Uh, we help, uh, we sit down with the business owners, we understand what skill set the business owners are looking for, and then we make a match uh, to the individuals that are coming through our centers. Uh, if we are unable to make a match, then we connect them to the training to make sure that they the, the, the skill sets that they need are in line with what the business owners are looking for. And then certainly uh, the work we do in our neighborhoods, because as you know, uh, part of the broader economic development strategy uh, is to have robust neighborhoods. And, and that includes having corridors that are uh, uh, viable, uh, corridors that uh, New Yorkers can um, shop and, and experience um, and have a good time. And that's the work that we do in the neighborhood development. Uh, one, uh, we help administer the process of uh, bid creation, uh, but a lot of the work that we've been doing recently is really making investments in, into local uh, uh, economic development organizations to help build their capacity uh, to address some of the needs in their local communities. Thank you. How long have you been with the agency, Commissioner? I've been uh, in uh, October, it will be 10 years actually. Um, so uh, this has been a passion of mine and I've started, uh, when I started at the agency, it was focused on minority and women owned businesses and then I moved to all small businesses. Um, and then two years ago, the mayor, uh, I was blessed enough uh, that the mayor tapped me to be commissioner for the agency. And what is your role as the commissioner of the agency? Well, I, I think it's still lead a dynamic agency. We have over 360 hardworking individuals at the agency, um, and certainly it's to set the tone and the culture um, of the agency to ensure that we deliver the services to New Yorkers. Uh, I'm very passionate about service and very passionate about uh, ensuring that um, we defy the stereotypes of government. Uh, so we do a lot of listening. Uh, we do a lot of work in uh, communities that uh, may not have been um, invested in previous administrations. Uh, so we're out there, and uh, certainly I'm pretty proud of uh, the team. Great. What is the purpose of today's testimony? So we were, it's a budget hearing, so I think you highlighted some of the things that you wanted to hear um, in regards of how we're using our funding um, and how we're helping New Yorkers. So basically it's to prioritize the agency's um, concerns for the year and the dollar amount that would be needed to achieve those objectives? Well, I, I think this is a, a healthy conversation in terms of, you know, your role is to provide oversight over our agency and, and certainly um, part of that oversight is to ensure that we are using taxpayer dollars as efficiently as possible and um, certainly, you know, we have a lot of programs um, with the agency and uh, we want to make sure that you know, the, what we're doing in the community is actually what the community um, uh, needs. And we do a lot of outreach in, in terms of hearing from business owners, hearing from uh, community-based organizations, hearing from universities. 
Uh, but certainly this is a, a partnership um, and, and this hearing also will uncover certain things that we may need to uh, work on. But I think today's priority is that we discuss the budget for the upcoming fiscal year and the needs of the agency to meet its goals. Correct. Great. So I guess we'll begin with the questions of this preliminary budget and spending levels that you're submitting. Um, that won't actually affect the amount of the public money that your agency will spend. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And there is a preliminary budget, an adopted budget, and then an actual budget. Can you walk us through that? So the, the preliminary budget is, is basically the, what we have put forward in terms of the needs of the agency. Um, I think this is a, a process where uh, we now work with council um, in terms of ensuring that our priorities are match the priorities that council and what you have heard in the community uh, to make sure that we're aligned. Uh, and then there's the, the back and forth that we as administration has with council. Um, and then we finally come up with the actual budget. Why is there always such a big difference between the preliminary and the adopted budget? Why are there such wide gaps between the two? If, if you're talking historically, I, th I think we've, you know, we have had, um, you know, changes. Uh, obviously, depending on the program, uh, depending on the priorities, uh, it is part of the negotiation that we have with council. Um, so in certain cases, uh, things may increase, things may decrease. Um, but I think this, that's a, a healthy part of budget negotiations. And the difference then between the adopted and the actual? So if, if you're specifically talking about, um, because in, sometimes in our budget we also have um, council funds. So for example, uh, council uh, through the discretionary uh, funding, uh, we are required to manage those contracts and that funding usually comes later in the cycle. So sometimes there is that disparity, but uh, I, I think that's probably what you're seeing in terms of the, the big gap in between the preliminary and the, the final actual. Do you have 2017 numbers, the preliminary? From 2017? Right. You mean last fiscal purposes year? So we can look at the three Just hold on one second. Is there a particular question in terms of 2017 and 20? For illustration purposes, I just want to show the three, and we'll do 17 and 18, and then I don't have the full budget now. work on 19. Oh, here. I don't know. Do you have it? No. I don't have it. No, we don't have it. We, we came prepared to talk about the the current fiscal year. Wow. Tell me about the current fiscal, the preliminary plan for 2019, the, the dollar amount. In, do you have a particular program or? Uh, no, the entire so budget, that your, your preliminary budget for 2019. Right, so the preliminary budget for 2019 is $172.7 million. Um, and as I said in the testimony, um, a certain percentage of that are, are, um, are actually pass-through funding. Uh, so the remaining $111.4 million uh, is actually allocated to SBS programs. And comparing the 19 to the 2018 preliminary budget, there's a difference of $43 million? That's right. Why is that? So some of that is uh, uh, a decrease in OTPS. So that's other than personnel. Um, and there's a number of things that's in there, some of which I talked about, for example, city council funds. Uh, they're not usually baselined. Um, so that usually comes in at the, the end of the cycle. Uh, there's a $6 million decrease in career pathways funding. 
uh, but that's an ongoing conversation uh, that could change. Uh, there's a $2.9 million decrease um, for uh, the allocation on, on the workforce side. Um, there's a $13.5 million decrease for the MWB bond and loan fund that wasn't including in, in this budget, uh, but that's more of a technicality. Um, there's a $19.5 million decrease in, uh, for EDC. Uh, there's a $1 million decrease for Governor's Island. Um, there's a $1 million decrease for the disparity study funding. Um, and there's uh, $800,000 decrease uh, for the Mayor's Office of MWB and a uh, $500,000 decrease for um, a MWB program. So I just want to go back to the difference between the preliminary and the adopted. And just looking at 2018 preliminary of $327 million, compared to an adopted of 216 million. That's a $100 million difference. And it seems that this year, 2019's preliminary budget is ex extremely low, where our adopted will be much higher. 59 was out of EDC. That's over 100 million bucks. That's what it went. Mm -hmm. OK. I'm going to ask, uh, right. do you want to? <coughs> yeah, the next one. Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Shazad Ali. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Budget for Small Business Services. Um, the reason for that change in the current, right, our current FY18 budget is $327 million compared to the adopted of 262 The big change in increases in that was $41 million was added in our FY18 current budget for the bus program. EDC's allocation because of the CDBG DR funds was increased by $59 million. So if you okay. add those two, that's close to the, over the $100 million why our budget has gone, our current budget has gone up. So my question to you is, do you want to swear him in? No. Okay, great. So my question to you is when we look at preliminary budgets and adopted budgets, mm -hmm. why isn't that at this phase can we introduce a budget that's going to be very close and historically looking at the last five years or four years, there has always been a tremendous jump between preliminary and the adopted budgets. But over the past few fiscal years, I can speak for that, we had significant monies we got for the CDBGDR funds that are usually added during the course of the budget. And also, for the last couple of years, we have been paying for the bus program, which the funds are usually added during the budget, not at adoption. So that's, those are the two big items that has been constantly have the big difference in our budget. Okay. And in estimating our preliminary budget, we couldn't put in values that historically um, could be reflected. So there's a more transparent <coughs> budget discussion. It's, it's difficult because of the CDBGDR. It's scheduled later on and it's added on. So it's... You know, it's, it's difficult to do that. So the CDBGDR is uh, Community Development uh, Block Grants, which is um, uh, federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, so, and especially with DR, I think that was a, a lot of that was related to uh, Hurricane Sandy and, and the sort of the, we had about seven years of funding uh, through that. Um, but I think, you know, we try to be as accurate as possible, uh, but like I said, uh, between preliminary and adoption, uh, there may be other priorities uh, that changes within the administration. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, we work closely with other partners uh, for the bus school bus uh, grant program. Um, so, we, you know, those are things that, that may come up in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, between the preliminary and the, ad and the adopted. Uh, so we make every effort to actually have an accurate budget, uh, but that's part of why we have two hearings. So uh, the first one is preliminary, and then uh, we'll come back to you in May uh, with something that's closer to what's adopted. Fair enough. So maybe then we can um, begin the conversation. I just want to acknowledge that Council members that have joined us are Council Ma Councilwoman Rivera and Ayola. Uh, Ayala, excuse me, corrected. You can mispronounce my name later. So, 
just to put things back into focus, as we talk about the budget needs of the agency, roughly your agency operates under how many different program areas? So, so we have uh, business services, we have neighbor development, um, we have the Division of Economic and Financial Opportunity, uh, which is uh, the division that's focused on the MW program, but they do a lot of business services. Um, and we also have workforce development. But then we also have uh, the internal support team. So this is the operation. So that's finance, legal, procurement, et cetera. Can we go through that one more time? How many is that? So we have four major divisions. Cool. However, we have the internal uh, support team, and then, of course, um, my office. Okay. So my, un my records show that we have 13 program areas that the agency is broken down into. 13 program areas? Yes. Um, are you talking about business? 13 are included in the program. Okay. So I would probably need to see your program areas. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, so there, there's some pass through in there. So you have the mayor's office of film and theater. Remember, I said that this is, uh, we serve as uh, a conduit. Uh, there is um, NYC and co, the EDC is in here. Uh, we do have a business development so some of some of this is some of the programs here are, are SBS programs and some of the programs are actually uh, the conduit uh, funding that we that we do before I continue I know that some of my colleagues have questions for you but I just wanted to acknowledge the 13 programs that were broken down that we can get an idea of a description from you what each stands for and whether they're passed through or yeah, we could certainly sort of right. bring that those two things together. Uh, but for SBS, it's neighborhood development, it's workforce development, it's business services, and in in on here it says MWBE, but that's our division of economic and financial opportunity. Right. So if we can take them one by one at a time, please, and let's begin with administrative, uh, the agency administrative and operations. That's our subject. You want to go ahead? Yeah, that's that's us. Are you, are you, you're, you're, you want more details in terms of yes, like what that is? Exactly. So that, that's our internal support team. So that's like legal, that's our, our procurement team, that's our financing team, that's our budget teams, that's our technology team. That's the team that keeps the agency ticking, basically. Great. And the line item in the preliminary budget for 2019 for that? Is it, are, are you? Referring to the line item in the budget, yes, the base, in your preliminary budget. Right. 17.3 17. million? Right. Okay. Comparing that to last year, 2018 adopted, mm -hmm. 23 million? So, okay. Uh, is, so you're asking us to verify that? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm what the question is. Yeah, I'm asking you to confirm what the budget was for the agency administrative and operations for 2018 compared to the preliminary proposed in 2019. Do you know what the reductions in the function are? One second, please. Okay. Okay, for the FY, right, for the administrative service operation, right, it's 17, 17 million in the um, preliminary budget, and in the adopted, it was 23. Um, the changes occurred because of various reasons. There was um, council funds included in the budget that drops off, it's not in the 19. There was um, various items, there was a realignment that we did, there was funding for different programs. There was, uh, you know, water fund variances. It's a combination of several items that 
give you that, you know, that $6 million that drops off. Well, a bulk of it was the council funding that was included in there. The council that, money? The council money. That that's dollar? Not, right, that's not in, yeah. Mm. What was that dollar amount? That dollar amount was almost half of that, or $3 million. $3 million. Three million. Good, thank you. And business development? No, you got that is one of the divisions that, that the commissioner spoke about. That's our mm -hmm. business services um, division. You're, you're going to ask again the difference? Yes, 2019 versus okay, 2018. There was, there was a 15, okay, there's a $15 million drop in that. Uh, again, a big chunk of that is council funding again, which is almost $4.5 million. There is the CDBG funds that drops off um, on that also. There was the MWB bond and loan fund that's not scheduled in 19 of 13 million, that drops off. Right. So those gives you that difference, almost over $15 million reduction in that. The difference, the dollar amount, I didn't hear. Excuse me? What was the, the dollar amount difference? Well, it's 15 million. 15 million, correct? 15.039. 15 okay. And the bulk, I give you the bulk items. Perfect. But yeah, yeah. And the same for the economic, uh, the EDC? EDC dropped by 19 million. Yeah. 19 million. 19 million. And the difference between we the don't purpose? We don't. In between know. those two. I don't have the EDC work out. They, you know, they negotiate that. Who negotiates that? EDC negotiates directly with OMB on that, yeah. So EDC I, I, negotiates yeah. directly with OMB? Yes. And you're just the pass along? Yes. Correct. Interesting. And for the NYC uh, co-tourism support? No it's the same, same, same. There was the same number. As there was no, no changes in the NYC no change. allocation. Contract services? Uh, that dropped by um, $979,000. Um, the bulk of that was we took the efficiency saving of uh, half a million dollars. And then um, the trust for the, the governor's island took a reduction of 470000 So those, those two give you the 979000 And that's roughly how much in difference? A million? 979000 Economic and Financial opportunities, MWBEs? Right, the, that's uh, one that's of the four divisions. Uh, again, another item there is almost $600,000 that's council funds that drops off. Um, there was the MWB disparity study of a million dollars that's not scheduled in 19. Um, the MWB certification was 500,000 drops off. Um, there was a council for the MWB study of 750,000 drops off. And those combination of items give you the difference of $2.9 million so difference. And when he says the, the MWB certification, um, that was a marketing, um, that was funding that we got for marketing. Right. Um, that is not in FY19. Neighborhood development. Uh, neighborhood development drops off by $2.8 million from the adopted to the preliminary budget. Um, those, the bulk of that change, again, is city council funds, almost uh, $2.5 million dropped off there. So that's, that was the bulk of it. The, and then there was um, some city community development funds drops off also. So that gives you the $2.8 million. Workforce development, one-stop center. Right. So it's a, there's a difference here. This item is $5.2, $5.3 million. Um, the bulk of that is the, uh, the program called Career Pathways that was funded. It's not scheduled in FY19 as of now, so that, that's almost, almost close to almost $6 million was on that funding stream, and there were some other technical uh, items also. And Workforce Development Program Management. Right, Workforce Development Program Management, there's a 12.2 million dollar difference there. Increase. Increase, right. right. And the bulk of that increase is the construction safety training program. We have almost eighteen million dollars scheduled in nineteen that was not in in um in FY eighteen. Um, and then we have other other various programs, the council funding also. We have got funding for green jobs, we got um, funding there was some wage adjustments and there was a council funds drops off of almost $9 million within that allocation. So that all those changes will give you the additional 12.2. Yeah. We Work. can, I just want to let you know, we can provide, you know, specific item number, but I'm, I'm just giving you the bulk item. Ballpark. Got it. Workforce development training? 
right, workforce development training. We had the, the um, CEO organization. Um, that funding was dropped off of almost $3.2 3, 3 million. Dollars. And economic and financial opportunity. Economic and financial. I, I, I don't, we, went, we went over that. You want labor to service. I'm sorry? Oh, labor service. There's no, there's a, no change there. No change. No change. No change. One dollar. Mm. And film theater and broadcasting. The film theater and broadcasting. It accounts for one person. The commissioner of the film office is on SBS payroll. It's just for one staff person. There's one person. Yes. Okay. But what is the dollar amount for the budget? Uh, line item. It should. It uh, her salary is close to two hundred. Uh, within. Wound it off about two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand? Yeah. What do you have right here? Even though it's not showing, I, uh, I'm, I have it here. I'm sorry. My the we're showing a zero for the right, preliminary. Right. It's, it's a zero, but we she is on our payroll, and it's it, it's probably scheduled under the uh, administration, agency administration operations. Right. It's under that that that. It goes in there. That's what they're saying that it's under agency administration. The 200,000 for? The one person. But there's no dollar amount associated for that line item in the 2019 preliminary, correct? Specifically for? No, there is. There is as I said, there's the salaries. There's one to cover the commissioner's salary. It's a, and that money is scheduled in the, under the agency administrations and operations. So why do we have someone on salary when there's no budget item associated for that expense? I, yeah. And it hasn't been one for the last three years, 17 right, so or two it, years. The line item, because if, if the reason why it has been there, if you go back, way back, the mayor's office of film, theater, and broadcasting was one of those passed through that SBS, they surpassed through the SBS, and then it was transferred over to the, to, um, to do it. So I guess that's why it's, it still remained there, but the funding for it dropped off. The only person we kept on our payroll was the commissioner. Help me understand, I'm sorry, yeah. maybe, what is? So it, it's, it's a legacy uh, budget entry. entry. Uh, many, many, many years ago, most of the funding through the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment used to come through SBS. Uh, it no longer goes through SBS. It actually goes through the Department of Information and Te Telecommunications and Technology. So the only thing that we still have on our line item is the commissioner's salary. The commissioner's salary or a staffer? Commissioner. The commissioner. So the commissioner is on SBS salary, but... On our payroll. On your payroll. And the rest of the way do it, I mean, the way MOM gets their funding is through Do It. Through Do It. The department, it's another yeah. city agency. Okay. Okay. We'll figure that one out later, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and the, right, the last one before my colleagues get to answer some questions uh, industrial manufacturing, 2019. Preliminary in 2018. There was a forty thousand dollar adjustment on that, and that was a result of the um, the efficiency savings. We took a forty thousand dollar reduction on that. But there's no change, I believe, from 19 to 18. Yeah, from 19 it went to oh, so, yeah, it went from 1460 it adopted to 1.5. So there was an increase of forty thousand. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, because these numbers are so interesting to some of my colleagues, I'm thinking they want to change some of the questions that they all have. Uh, first off, I'd like to hear from uh, Councilman Levine. Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Jonai. Thank you, Commissioner. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Um, L train, L train, L train. Yes. There's going to be in FY19. The L train apocalypse is going to start. <laughs> the L apocalypse. The L apocalypse. Um, <clears throat> the clock is ticking. 
Um, what are we doing? So there's, you know, half of this conversation is about, uh, when, when we're talking on the L train, uh, is about the, 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 the transit uh, solutions and how you move, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on buses over the Williamsburg Bridge every day. Um, uh, and the other question is, what are we going to do for the small businesses that uh, rely on um, on uh, traffic, patron traffic from um, from Manhattan along, particularly along the parts of the L train in Brooklyn that um, and and Manhattan and Manhattan. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're on both sides. Yes. Uh, but what are we doing? What's what's SBS doing? Where so, are our options? What are things that we would like to try to do but we can't do right now because of state law? Are we looking at tax incentives? Are we looking at uh, property tax rebates? Are we looking at um, uh, other other measures to help other than just um, you know some nice signage saying shop here? But if the people can't get there, um, uh, they're not going to be able to shop there. So I got a lot of businesses in my district that have invested their life savings, uh, and then and then this happened. So please share. So a couple of things. One, uh, thank you for um, obviously being partner with us in, in terms of um, helping us being a little bit proactive uh, in this particular area. Um, you know, as, as we all are looking at figuring out what the final transportation plan would be, I think we'll be able to determine the best course of action. But in the meantime, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. In, 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 well, so in the, in, in <laughs> we the can meantime, be sure that the situation is going to be really bad. We can certainly, um, and we have been working with you know chambers and local uh, organizations to figure out what it is that we need to do. Some of it is being proactive in terms of ensuring that the business owners uh, are aware of what their protections are in terms of their lease. Um, and certainly, we want to make sure that um, you know we uh, at least let business owners know some of the services that we have. So, for example, if you know there is a reduction in foot traffic, then you know helping business owners figure out how to either modify um, their their um, the the way they run their business to adjust to that reduction um, is one of the things that we can do. Um, we certainly are happy to work with you and our other uh, city partners, uh, like the Department of Finance and um, and and maybe even Economic Development Corporation. If you're talking about uh, property tax, et cetera, to figure out what it is that we can do to support those uh, small businesses. Uh, but we have um, have had experience um, with. Uh, infrastructure work period um, that is always a, a challenge to small businesses uh, we have an outreach team that uh, if there is uh, impact to small businesses uh, they work with the agency that's doing the work uh, to figure out ways to mitigate the impact this one is obviously uh, much this larger a, right this is a di I mean it's, it's a, I think this is different from other large infrastructure projects because unlike unlike Second Avenue where um, you know, that was a big impact, but, uh, but didn't really necessarily affect people's ability to get to 2nd Avenue. No, I would, right now, I, you know, under sorry. the L train, I mean, I mean I, and I appreciate maybe small businesses maybe doing more online business or something like that, but for like restaurants, I mean, like they can't, I don't know how they would modify their business. It's, if, if their foot traffic is cut by 50% um, and they're stuck with the same rent uh, that they signed on their 10-year lease, you know, what do you, what do, I don't even know, what, what do we do? What would we even do? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing, uh, you know, innovative ideas from anybody, but including SPS. Right. So I, I think, you know, part of uh, figuring out the ideas, um, because, you know, we don't know if it's going to cut foot traffic by 50%. The, 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 we, we need to actually see what the plan is. And then once we see what the plan, uh, the, the mitigation plan that the MTA puts out, uh, then we'll be able to figure out if there is something that we can do, um, if the projections in foot traffic, um, based on what that plan looks like. So who's we'll, it, sorry? That's at MTA is going to do the pr uh, projections on the foot traffic. Who's who's going to be doing those types of projections? Well, I mean, we we can certainly work with you know local organizations to figure out if there is the need for that. I, I think one, what I'm saying is that. You know, we've tried to be proactive, um, and we continue to be proactive to get into the neighborhoods. I think, you know, it's for us um, right now. We know it's going to be 
um, the, the line is going to be shut down, but we don't know exactly what impact it's going to have in terms of how difficult it would be for Manhattanites to get to Brooklyn and vice versa. It's going to be Brooklyn very, to very difficult for Manhattanites to get to Brooklyn. It's going to be very, very difficult. It's going to be very, very difficult to get one way or the other because just around Bedford Avenue, that whole stretch around there, mm -hmm. it's going to be like, you know, it's going to, where it used to, right now it takes about six or seven minutes to get from Bedford to First Ave and maybe 10 minutes to get to, uh, to Union Square. It's going to take 35, 40 minutes maybe. Um, it is going to, I mean, people are not going to want to go. I mean, there's going to be, whatever it is, whether it's a 25% decrease in foot traffic or a 50% decrease in foot traffic, it's going to be very significant. I mean, I went on the, uh, I mean, all you have to do is go, go to Bedford Avenue at 8.30 in the morning and try to get on the L train going into Manhattan or go to Union Square at 5.30 in the afternoon and try to go back into Brooklyn and, and then think about all those people trying to get on buses to go over the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, with the traffic that's on the Williamsburg Bridge anyway. And, you know, you start to think about, like, is anyone really going to want to spend their weekend right. doing that? I don't think so. I mean, so, so I th some will, but... So, so I, I think, you know, um, this is worth a, a continued conversation in terms of um, uh, us sitting down and figuring out um, what are some of the concerns, uh, whether it's, you know, a, a, a business that's stuck in a lease or uh, property tax, et cetera, um, and then figure out a course of action. Is SBS, is there anything in SBS's 19 budget specifically dedicated to doing that type of outreach for L train related businesses in the FY19 budget? Because that's going to happen in an FY19 because the, the shutdown's happening in FY19. So we have already been out in the community doing outreach. If you're asking if there's a specific program for the businesses to impact, no, there isn't. Okay. Maybe we should look at that as part of our FY19 conversations. Um, it might require additional outreach staff um, to actually go out and do all that work. Again, this is, you know, this is, it, unlike major inf other major infrastructure projects, this is cutting off, you know, a major uh, means of transportation uh, from two uh, major small business areas, Brooklyn, along the L train, Williamsburg, and into Bushwick, and the east side of Manhattan. Gotcha. In the west side of Manhattan. Well, happy to talk to you about um, some of the, your thoughts and, and figure out what we can do. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Jonai. Congratulations on your new committee. You clearly know what you're talking about, so thank you. Um, Commissioner, always great to see you. Good Thanks to see you. for all your work helping our small businesses. I was reading, I'm sorry I wasn't here, but I was reading through your testimony and I couldn't help but notice that um, something was missing. And that was your report on worker cooperatives. The, we didn't include it. Uh, know, obviously, there's, there's, a, lot I, that, I, the there's a lot that we do. The silence was deafening. Yep. I mean, there's a lot that we do, so I, I didn't want to keep everyone here for an hour talking about all uh, the great work, but um, certainly, you know, the work of cooperatives are, are important to um, us, and we continue to work with uh, council. Are you aware of how many jobs have been created? For, uh, on Through our work, work of cooperatives? cooperatives. Um, so we have a, a relationship with a lot of uh, community partners. Um, I don't have the number um, right now. Um. So 84 worker cooperatives have been created over the past three years and 500 jobs. And that's with um, you guys taking the lead, being incredibly wonderful about working with the community partners and helping to keep everything organized. And uh, so many of us on the council are really appreciative of that. Um, what I'm wondering, given that this is a program that um, has definitely been successful from, I, I think, our joint perspective, whether or not uh, this is something that, that you feel is a, a job, a successful job creating program, and whether or not the administration would be willing to take on the funding for these job creation organizations um, so the city council doesn't have to f fund it every year. Um. 
So um, that's a great question, and I think it's worth further conversation. Um, obviously, uh, one of the things that we're balancing is the federal budget uncertainty. Um, so I, I, I'm unable today to commit to uh, the administration um, uh, uh, taking on additional uh, funding support, um, but we can certainly talk about what that, you know, um, you know how we can continue the partnership and um, figure out future steps in terms of uh, the funding for the program. Okay, I mentioned it to um, James Patchett this morning, and he said EDC you might be interested um, as well, and that he'd like to learn more. And what I would really appreciate is an opportunity to sit down with you and he, and maybe some of our partner groups to talk about whether or not this is some uh, program that EDC could invest in. That's great, and James is just one floor below me, so that's oh, gonna okay, be a very great. easy conversation. Appreciate that. Do you know if anyone's been pursuing the notion of um, uh, developing the um, bus, the school bus worker cooperative, if that's gotten any legs to it? I don't know, no. Okay, um, and that's it. Thank you for all your work. I really appreciate right. how hard you're trying. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rivera. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, congratulations. Thanks, thanks. Last time I saw you, I was a staffer. So you were <laughs> doing your thing then as well. So I had a couple of questions um, about career pathways. And so you say it's a roadmap to an inclusive workforce and that you're connecting job seekers with employers. So I, I didn't see it in the budget and I wanna know what is gonna be SBS's contribution to this? So it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. Obviously we, um, the initial funding was a three year uh, pilot uh, to test the strategy that working with employers and understanding how to actually do uh, projections in the workforce and we focus on sectors that are, are growing in New York City or actually have a meaningful wage. Uh, so healthcare, technology, uh, construction, food and beverage service, um, and also industrial and manufacturing. Uh, we think it's been uh, highly successful. There's a lot of um, wins there in terms of individuals who've been trained, who've been put into uh, jobs that um, are, have higher wages. Uh, so certainly it's a conversation that's ongoing um, in this budget process uh, to ensure that we have continued funding for it. So there's a possibility we'll see an investment come May? Correct. So you mentioned healthcare um, as a growing industry, and, and I want to know some details on how you're expanding those partnerships, so, specifically in the healthcare industry. So there's a couple of things that we've we've done. Um, uh, so one, that was one of our first in industry partnerships, and just so you understand, the industry partnerships is we work with the private sector. Uh, so there's a number of hospitals and um, uh, medical uh, uh, organizations that we connect with. Um, and we actually, uh, for example, have one of our centers um, that's focused, uh, we have a healthcare uh, center uh, that's specifically focused on placing people into healthcare jobs. So this is everything from medical technicians uh, to certified peer recovery advocates um, to also, I'm forgetting some others, um, but there's a lot in our, um, in our training um, where uh, we actually help individuals because of the changes in the healthcare sector adjust um, their skill sets so um, we take advantage of some of the new opportunities there. So in terms of your workforce um, centers in term, and, and job placements specifically, do you have data as to where you're placing individuals and the type of New Yorkers that you're assisting? So for example, the long-term unemployed, disabled New Yorkers, immigrants. Do you have the type of New Yorkers that you're serving and where they're going? So we can get you the specific num numbers in terms of um, the, the type of New Yorkers, but just, in, just uh, generally, uh, our centers are, are, so the way our, cent our system is built, uh, we have hub centers, uh, so those are the main centers that are located in the five boroughs in, um, 
in uh, major transit areas, but what we realize is that we also need to be in other uh, outer boroughs. Um, so we have also expansion centers. Uh, a lot of the individuals that use our centers are long-term unemployed. We have a close relationship with the Department of Labor. Uh, so anyone who is unemployed, uh, part of the process is actually integrating with, is interacting with our system. Um, we uh, have a focus on out of school, out of work youth, um, because one of the areas that I'm really passionate about is ensuring that individuals who may not have a traditional path from high school to college have a skill set that they can use um, and actually have a meaningful career. Uh, so we actually piloted a center in the Bronx um, in one of the highest density um, uh, areas that have a large population of out of school, out of work youth. We work closely with the Department of Education uh, to uh, uh, not only uh, provide, um, and I'm gonna date myself now, uh, GED training, but it's not GED training, it's high school equivalency, that's what it's called now, uh, that's contextualized uh, so that way they can actually have a career in the healthcare field, for example. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of um, our focus is on underrepresented communities. We have a center in Washington Heights that's focused on immigrant um, New Yorkers. And again, just because there's a center that's focused on one thing, uh, it's a whole system. Uh, so we also help individuals who are formerly incarcerated. Uh, so we have a network of about 100 employers who have uh, made an agreement with us that they are willing to hire individuals coming through our center. And uh, one of the things that we do is we test a model and then we uh, expand it and scale it system-wide. So what are your, what's your, your metric for success? How are you tracking the placements and what do you consider, I guess what are the parameters for considering a placement successful? So one of the things that um, in my testimony I talked about, we focus a lot on the quality of the job. Uh, so we no longer work with companies that pay less uh, than the living wage. Um, so certainly one of the things that we saw that we think is very successful is an uh, uh, increase um, uh, of, I think we went from 45% um, in terms of uh, full-time jobs uh, about four years ago to now we're placing individuals, uh, about 80% of the jobs that we place individuals in into our full-time jobs. So that's one metrics for success. Um, certainly uh, we look at and we have very, um, when we do our training, uh, we have very robust goals. Uh, so when we actually put out an RFP for a, a provider to actually help us with the training that have the expertise, it's not just about the training uh, because you can train a lot of people, but if there isn't a job at the end of uh, that training, it doesn't really help. Uh, so our providers have to hit an 80% placement, uh, job placement goal uh, after training. Uh, so that's just, those are just two of the metrics that we use uh, for success, and uh, we've been uh, meeting uh, those goals. Okay, just um, one more question. So you mentioned in your testimony that you give grant, uh, so it's a two-part question, uh, grant opportunities to, to bids. What are, what are those grant opportunities? What are they typically used for? So uh, bids are uh, independent 501c3s, um, so uh, similar to local uh, development corporations, uh, we provide additional opportunities for funding. So, uh, for example, um, our neighbor the grants. What do you, what do they mostly use that money for? So, our neighborhood challenge, for example, uh, bids can use that for uh, retail attraction. They can use it for, um, you know, if they're doing a specific event. Um, and usually, events bring individuals uh, to a commercial corridor. Um, for the last uh, neighborhood challenge that we did. Uh, we specifically wanted um, to challenge organizations that were getting into grants to use technology, for example, uh, to figure out ways of increasing uh, consumer spending in a particular commercial district by using technology. Uh, so it all depends on uh, what we uh, are looking at to uh, what problem we're trying to address. And have you cultivated or started similar relationships with merchant associations? Uh, there are a number of them. I know some of them work closely with the bids. Absolutely. So, uh, and one of the things, you know, um, you know, it, 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 the, there's different uh, uh, size organizations across the city. I think well, that's one of the unique things about SPS is that we have a network of community partners. 
Uh, so uh, some of the programs that I talked about, like our Neighborhood 360 program, our Neighborhood Fellows program, a lot of it is to build the capacity of those uh, smaller organizations to make sure that they have the capacity to address the local needs on the ground. Uh, so for example, our Neighborhood Fellows Program, we place uh, staff members uh, that we fund in organizations uh, to address particular issues. Uh, and that's been um, very successful and, and, um, and certainly uh, a lot of organizations have uh, really uh, talked about uh, how great that program has been. Um, our Neighborhood um, 360 Program, we've actually uh, funded local organizations over the next three years to address uh, uh, some of the uh, findings in our CDNAs. Um, and we are now, uh, applications are still open for Avenue OIC program uh, where we are also changing that model. So it's a three year consistent funding uh, for local organizations to really make an impact in a commercial district. I, I ask because, you know, with the L train shutdown, there are merchant associations in our communities that are really trying to build and, and develop a, a strategy to be more proactive in terms of retail attraction. So if those opportunities could be extended to some of the merchants associations or if there's some information that I could pass on to my district and of sure. course to Levin's, I would love some of that information. That's actually something we can definitely talk about and do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to remind you that one of the terms and conditions from fiscal 2018 budget was uh, to provide council with workforce one data by April 1st. Um, please share along the information that you just provided uh, with that update, and are we on par to have a up to have that information available by, by April first? Yes, we are. Great. And as a follow-up to the council members' uh, mention of merchant associations uh, and organizations, do we even have a list of all of the merchant associations and organizations throughout the five boroughs? Mm. It's, it's, so we don't have a comprehensive list, but we, we, we have, yeah. So what, why don't you, uh, I'm gonna ask Chris Goddard to come in, he's Assistant Commissioner for Neighborhood Development. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Council Members. Um, we don't have a comprehensive list of every organization. Some of them don't have the capacity to find us, but we're constantly working with Council Members and Community Boards to find out who they are. Uh, but we do have outreach lists probably with about at least um, 150 to 160 organizations that we're reaching out to regularly, in addition to email blasts and communications that go out to close to 1,000 to 1,500 different organizations or representatives of those places. So they're reaching, well, at least that's how we're trying to reach our services out to those organizations. Please provide us with that list that you have. It would be very helpful as we move forward. we Will do. So I know that we have a lot to cover, Commissioner, and you're so eager to do this, so let's keep it going, chugging along. Um, I initially brought up the 13 program or initiatives that were broken down in categories, but let me continue by, does the SBS have any programs or initiatives uh, that, are, that are being funded through its budget that don't directly fulfill the mission of your agency? Um, no. No. So, so then let me get right into it then. In 2014, the SBS asked the council for one-time funding to help school bus companies continue services. Is this correct? That's correct. On August 19, 2014, Chris Brenner, who at the time served as the chief of staff in the mayor's office of labor relations, testified that this grant program would encourage school bus companies to offer better wages. As head of the agency that oversees this program, do you still believe that is the case? Yes, I do. At this time, when the, administrator, when the administration first asked the council to pass the legislation, it argued it was a one-time, one-year measure that was needed to ensure smooth service for the year and give the city time in the next several months to seek state legislation. What, do, what did the administration mean by this? So I, th I think just to, to, to clarify, so we have the, st the, in our statute, we have the ability to administer grant programs uh, to businesses. 
Um, so that is why um, you know we are the agency that's responsible for administering the grant program. Um, you know, the administration has been looking at ways uh, in terms of long-term long solutions to ensure the safety um, of, uh, of our school kids. Um, the program is to ensure that the, you know, 1,400 individuals who uh, look after our kids are well-trained and they have a fair wage. Um, so, you know, within that construct, um, clearly the administration continues to look for ways to do that. Uh, but again, we are responsible for administering the grants to the companies that, um, that are part of the program. Right, but specifically, have you been successful in finding state legislative remedy, long-term solutions? So our role is just to administer the grant program. If you're asking on the policy, um, of, uh, because this is a, a procurement issue with uh, another agency, um, that is a question that I'm unable to answer. Our focus is really ensuring that the grants to the businesses are um, awarded uh, appropriately. Okay. So then we should assume that the administration is, is not able, until they're able to obtain a state legislation remedy that you'll continue to fund this program indefinitely? So I'm not, so we have- The grant. Right, so as, as far as I know, there's money in the next fiscal year uh, for us to continue funding um, the grant program. Uh, I, I don't know if there's, um, you know, beyond, beyond the next fiscal year. But the basis of the grant was to, originally you said the basis of the grant was for- Is to ensure that we have trained workers uh, who are transporting our, our students to school. So you don't think that'll hold true for the upcoming years? That, that is a procurement question, and we are, we are not the procuring agency. We just administer the grant program. So right. the agency that actually is doing the procurement for the school, for the bus, uh, for the school bus drivers, um, or companies, are, that's, that's more of a question for, for that agency. Right, but until something changes, that grant will be available through SBS. So I, I could only speak to what I know, and what I know is that the grant, uh, the funding is there for the next fiscal year. Uh, I don't know. So right, so so there's a little bit of funding for the next fiscal year, but the previous, but the next, if you're asking if it's indefinitely going to be at SBS, and I don't know, I don't have the answer to that question. Now help me understand the purpose. How many bus companies have received funding from this program with this grant? So far only, only one company has taken advantage of the program. Which company is that? Uh, that is Reliant. Okay. Roughly how many school bus companies does the city currently work with that provide similar services? Again, so th that, that's a, so we are the, so our purpose is to administer the grant for companies that apply. Uh, that question is really, that, that is a question for the Department of Education, not for SBS. So how many other companies applied for this grant? Only one company applied for this. Was it open to other companies? Yes, it was. And I guess the grant will be offered to companies in this fiscal period as well? It's every school year, so yes, if other companies want to apply, they can. Oh, I find that's right. I, I'm being inundated by emails and letters saying that this is an unfair, this is meant for, um, this grant is provided to only one provider, we've never been able to, to apply for it, no one considers our needs, and it's become a debacle of a sort. So, I mean, when we put out the grant application, it was open to all companies. I'll have to look into that a little further. Um, Reliant, the bus company that you refer to, do you, how many, how much of the service for the entire city does that provide? Uh, I believe it's a $1 billion. Um, so just a reminder, we, we just administered the grant program. Uh, so questions about routes, questions about employees, that is not, 
uh, something that I can answer. That is question. That is a question for the contracting agency. Contracting agency, but you, prov the grant is done through your agency. Correct. And you have no input and no knowledge of the procurement for this grant. You're just a pass through. We did not procure the. We did not procure that that particular service. All right, but I just asked you a moment ago: Is there anything in the budget that you're dealing with that doesn't directly fulfill your mission? And you said no. So, our mission is mm -hmm. to create economic opportunity for New Yorkers. If you're asking, does it is it within our mission to ensure that 1,400 individuals are able to keep their jobs? and have a fair wage, that is certainly within our mission. And that's why we, through our charter, we can actually administer this grant program. Okay, so the What you're asking is specifics about a contract that we are not responsible for. But yet the money's passed through SBS. We administer the grant program. You administer the grant program for a grant that you don't help to procure. We administer the grant program because what the grant is doing is maintaining a fair wage for the drivers uh, for bus companies. For one bus company. For bus companies. Only one company has applied. Okay. I, I'm a little baffled, but we'll continue to look into this, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of dialogue in the future um, over this issue. The New York State Constitution prevents New York City from giving money directly to a private interest unless there is an overwhelming public purpose and benefit. This is meant to ensure the city doesn't use public money to play favorite and to put a finger on the scale for one private entity's interest over another. Would you agree that picking a winner and determining losers isn't the proper role for government? I, I'm not clear on that on that question. Are you asking what? So, so we have been guided by the law department, um, and in terms of there is a public purpose to the program, um, and we have the charter authority to administer the grant program. But it's not for government to determine winners and losers on a fair bidding process or of an RFP. Again, you're asking about uh, I'm asking you you're asking a procurement question and we are not the procurement agency. No we I'm have asking. we have the charter authority to administer a grant program um, because the public purpose is to ensure a fair wage for workers. I'm asking for the role of government and your agency it's not to pick winners and losers overall. So there is a procurement process uh, mm -hmm. that my agency follows, um, and we pick the best, um, any company that wants to provide services to SBS, uh, we pick the best quality for the best price. That, that is not, you know, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's how we operate at SBS. Well, the question's a little bit more directly. I would, SBS would not be, it would not be in the best interest of government or the agency for SBS to pick a winner or a loser. It would be for the benefit of public interest a solely. Winner, a winner and loser in what? In anything, in grants or uh, a procurement of any type, or whether it be funding or through your budget at all. So. It would be an open I've, and transparent I've, I've, and accountable right. and, and that has transaction all, and that is always, based on best practices and right. not to put your finger on a scale for any one particular vendor. But that would be illegal, right? Exactly. Okay. So it's not the intent of government or your agency, correct? Correct. Good. In line with the same questioning, how much grant assistance has this one company, Reliant, received from your agency? So, so far in the past three years, it's been $92.5 million. And what is, that's for years 
15, 16, 16 and 17. 17. Correct. And 18? 18, it's uh, 41.8 million. Okay. And what do we have in preliminary 2019? We do not have anything in 19. Just 140,000. 140,000. Yeah, which covers the summer months. Okay. So we have a preliminary of 140,000 for 2019, but that will certainly not be enough uh, of a grant for Reliant to continue its operations moving forward? That's... Or are they applying for that correct. grant now for 2019? No, that, that is correct. In 19, there isn't a budgeted amount. Uh, for the full year of operation. And that grant will be readily available to bid to for all our, for all to apply all other or is this reliant solely for 2019? No, at the beginning of every school year mm -hmm. uh, any bus companies can apply. When is that grant open to the public? apply for. Hi, Andrew Schwartz, uh, Council at uh, Small Business Services. As far as the grant, yeah, it's done by a City Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking, and at that time when the rules are effective, uh, companies can apply for the grant. So the answer is when will it be available? It would probably be announced in the fall. I mean, it's been slightly different dates because right now there is no program in place for fall 18 into 18, 19 school year. We don't have the program operative for that. We're talking about the current school year now that'll end in June. That's the fourth year we've done the program. And you have 140,000 to finish up the summer months and then we begin the school year again in September. At so between now and September, I'm sure there will be an application for the grant? Well, there's no plan. Right. If there is a program in the 18-19 school year, that will be announced. But I do want to say the 140000 is only to cover the administrative costs and staff. And the $41 million, we will, uh, when that gets paid out, we'll see if any additional funding is needed in FY19 to finish this school year. So elaborate that 140000 is for what purpose? Staffing in the agency. Staff, uh, who's that administers the grant program at SBS. I thought the commissioner just said that was for summer. That's what I want to just correct that statement. So the 140000 has nothing to do with the summer bus services that Rewind is providing, but it will be for staffing that administers the grant that's already been issued. And have they been paid for 2018? No, they have not been fully paid for 2018. The $41.8 million has not been paid. How much for, of that have they been paid? Uh, for this school year, probably about, about $30 million, $31.5 million. So they have a remaining payment for the last school year, and this school year has not been paid out yet, the current school year. When is that money expected to go through following the grant that yeah, during this, this spring. In the spring. Yeah, and remember, it is a reimbursement, so Reliant has to have paid out to their employees, and they get reimbursed for those payments. And that'll, that'll be expected sometime in the spring? Correct. Okay, good. So I, it just, I understand what you're saying, that this is just a grant that you pass through in procurement and contracts. But for the past four years, this grant has been awarded to one company only. Am I correct? Correct. Yes. yes. And for the record, has anyone, has any other company applied for this grant during that four year period? I think there were inquiries about it, but there are criteria in it. I think your report uh, that the finance division puts out, the briefing paper, gives a good background on why 
the uh, law was first passed by the council to support the drivers and workers on the buses and to give them, as the commissioner said, the fair wages and benefits that they had been receiving before uh, the last administration bid these out without the employee protection provisions. So I think, you know, that explains that purpose. And there are certain criteria that the companies are paying those higher salaries and getting reimbursed and that they're agreeing to hire off something called the master seniority list only. So there are certain restrictions if a company was going to apply and use this grant. What are those criteria again? It's using uh, the master seniority list, which is a uh, list that the Department of Education maintains. And again, we wouldn't be in position to go into the details of that, but if we pay out the grant to Reliant, it's for employees that the Department of Education reviews and tells us they are certified workers. So it, this one company is the only one that qualified under that scenario? Because it doesn't sound like, it, it's just strange that if this was an open grant for other companies that they could also apply and you're not I'm not getting that on the description you just gave me right I think the comp reliant has the bulk of the routes that would bid out as explained in your report here and the employees under it say, say that so one. they are the they have the bulk of the routes that were bid out without the employee protection provisions as described in your report. They have a bulk, so there's the bulk. others that don't? I couldn't tell you specifically, though. I think, as the commissioner said, really, it's the Department of Education, their Office of Pupil Transportation, that could give more information on that. OK. So let me just go through some numbers and see if you can help answer and better explain or help us understand how this whole grant passes to this one company four years in a row. And if you can't, I understand. but. I was hoping that you would be able to explain. So the, and just for simplistic purposes, this grant program was the mayor's initiative and the city council went along with it, correct? In year one, for year 2014. Yes. Okay. And the grant program came about solely because of the employee benefits that were not included in the bid process? Is that what I'm understanding? I think that's fair to say, yes. Is there anything more that you can add to that, or? Uh, I think for more details, again, it's the Office of Labor Relations or the Department of Education and the Law Department. So it. You can't answer any more questions about this grant, although it's ministered through your agency. Am I understanding this correctly? That you, you're, so we are, we are the agency that reimburses the company. Mm -hmm. um, it, and certainly if you're asking questions about the reimbursement process, if you're asking questions uh, about how, many, how much money that has been uh, put out, that, that is certainly a question, is questions we can, a we can answer. Uh, if you're asking questions about routes and um, the different, you know, um, it is not, it is a procurement that was done by another agency. So then we're safe to assume that in 2019 there will not be a grant for this as far as you know. In, in 2019 there is no money allocated as far as we know. So there should be no May adjustment or a grant I, that's I open cannot. or a November plan that's going to include this through a modification as has been done for the last three years. As that, is not, that is not something I can say with certainty. As you know, whenever there's negotiations in budgets, things change. This is the, the preliminary budget, so you know the next time we come before you, uh, there might be completely different numbers. So in 2018 preliminary budget, was this brought up at the budget, the preliminary, during the preliminary budget discussion. Yes, it was. In 2018? Yes, it was. Do we have that number in the 2018 preliminary? 
I'm sorry, you said in 2008, we're in 2018 now. In 2000, so in 2017, um, we also had to testify about the program. Preliminary During budget. During the preliminary budget, correct. So in 2017, it was in the preliminary budget uh, report. Well, for the 18 budget in 17. Okay, then what about 16? Did the preliminary budget report show that? Because it's my understanding that it never shows up in the preliminary budget discussions. It only comes about after the preliminary discussions. I don't it's done through a modification, whether it be a November plan right. or... I, I don't recall, but I mean, it's the, is the question, are you questioning the, 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 the budget numbers or... I'm, I'm, trying to be as helpful as possible to figure out what the question is. So then the 41 million that was fiscal 2018, 41 million dollars, at what point was that budgeted? That was in the preliminary budget? Correct. Yes. It, I believe it came in through a modification in November. Well, then I guess we'll wait and see what happens in 2019 and with this preliminary budget, and I hope that it doesn't appear uh, to come in after uh, the budget negotiations and in the November plan. Do any of my colleagues, I guess they all left. I know that. Oh. Well, good. Thank you, council members. Enjoy your trip to Somos. Let me just go back to the last question of this because I, we're going to have plenty of public testimony on it. And I really do hope you can um, stay here, Commissioner, so we can hear from those that want to talk more about this particular grant and how unfairly uh, many feel it uh, benefited one company only, um, which creates a slew of other issues. But. The numbers, keeping these numbers in mind, can you tell the committee how this is a benefit to the public, or better yet, how does this demonstrate that SBS has been a good steward of the public money that has been entrusted with through this particular grant? I think just to, to uh, reiterate what I said, um, this program helps get our kids to school safely, um, it supports and helps uh, keep a well-trained uh, staff of uh, drivers. Um, so if you ask how it benefits the public, I think there's a lot of parents who sleep well at night knowing that the people who are transporting their kids are, are trained in... Um, and not all, just some are benefiting from this. There's plenty that I, are not. You know, but so the, the fact that we have individuals who are well-trained and paid a fair wage is... Uh, the, the public benefit. Okay, because there's a belief that this company purposely underbid on this contract and was later given a bus bail out that benefited one company solely uh, from others. And through this grant that is administrated through SBS has benefited handsomely compared to the other industry providers of similar service. Um, we're going to continue looking into this and working with you. I really do hope that this is not a grant that will be administered through SBS or any other agency or authority in this government and in the future, um, particularly benefiting one provider over the rest. So let me get into headcount and transparency of the number of employees that you currently have. Uh, you earlier stated they have 362 full-time positions in fiscal 2018 and 19? Yes. Okay. However, the agency's actual headcount every month in 2018 has been almost 90 less than what is in your plan. Um, at this point, I can't confirm that because 
you have to bear in, take into consideration we, the construction safety training initiative where we got 44 lines, we have not hired anyone for that, those positions yet. We're still you know, working out on the program. Mm -hmm. I can go backwards month by month from starting with June 2017 to July 2016, and I can show you the exact number of employees that you had. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you asking why are we not fully staffed? I'm asking why we are in the preliminary plan showing 362 full-time positions with a dollar amount and historically in all of 18, 17, and 16, we've never come close to that number. So I think, you know, whenever we have programs, we anticipate to actually hire into those programs. Um, but those, those numbers actually, um, you know, uh, Personnel changes on a daily basis. Um, either I'm hiring individuals or people are retiring, people are moving on to other opportunities. Uh, so I, I don't think you'll ever see a 100% match between what we have budgeted and actual. Is it your goal to strive for filling those vacancies? Clearly, yes. I, I'm, I mean, I do everything possible to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that we have a culture at SBS where we can attract talent, where we can retain talent. Um, we are in the lowest in terms of unemployment rate. Um, and of course, we're government. I mean, part of the challenge that I have is competing with the private sector. Uh, right now, people are looking to get opportunities in the private sector. Uh, I have been out there and encouraging people to look at government as a career opportunity. Um, and, you know, in some cases, I try to steal individuals from other agencies. I mean, it, it's, it is very, very uh, competitive in terms of getting the best talent for the agency. But historically, and in your tenure, have we ever come close to full capacity? Uh, since I've been commissioner, we've had a very, very robust unemployment rate. Um, so, you know, when I first came to government in 2008, when everything, you know, we had the uh, financial implosion and a lot of companies were laying off. I think that was the best time for government because a lot of people uh, qualified uh, talent was coming to government. Um, you know, over the past you know 10 years or so, the economy has improved, uh, and certainly you know we have to uh, continue to try to figure out ways to attract talent. But historically, you've never even come remotely close to filling those vacancies in as high as. Um 30% off its full capacity. Uh, during my tenure, I don't, I don't know if that, that, that number is accurate, um, but certainly, you know, I'd be, I'd be certainly happy to, you know, uh, for you to help me figure no. out ways to... to so the question is, staff. then why, if, we're, if we don't expect, and we should strive, of course, uh, and the bar is so high that we'll never achieve full capacity, and historically we can see that we don't even come remotely close. Why do we budget for 362 jobs that will never come to fruition? I wouldn't say that that would never. I mean, we, we, we have hardworking individuals at the agency, um, so there are individuals I'm, who I'm sure you do. I'm not continue. denying they're hardworking. Right, so those vacancies, I mean, the work is still being done, but we need to figure out ways uh, to actually ease the burden on the staff who are doing no, but multiple things. Isn't that the issue that the planned headcount is not giving a realistic picture of the need of the agency? So how are we doing without them? Where's the disservice? Where is the lack of filling these positions impacting your agency and its responsibilities to fulfill the needs of um, the 13 program areas it is responsible for? So are because you're saying that we should strive, we want to, we have hardworking men and women, but I keep going back to if you have as high as 60 vacant seats at any given time, and that was as of June 2017, uh, the exact number is 58. Uh, in May of 2017, it was 45. In April, it was those, 45. Yeah, those numbers don't seem right, um, because well, I, I don't think I have... Uh, the most recent we had was December. December's, uh, as of December 2017, 
you had 269 full-time employees or equivalent of. According to the records I have here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to, uh, because your numbers are not sort of matching what I have, so we certainly can reconcile those numbers. But these are the numbers that we were given by and provided. It's from OMB documents. It's from OMB documents. And we can clearly show that historically you have been way under the projected numbers of full-time employees. So the question is either we don't need those positions or there is a disservice that is not allowing you to fulfill your commitments and obligations to the 13 program areas. I, I, I would not sit here and say that we uh, certainly, you know, in every area we can always improve on our service. So, um, you know, we, we try to, you know, f make sure that we have enough staff um, and, you know, we continue to deliver those services. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say that there is a, a disservice. But the, these unfilled positions, do we understand or accurately does it reflect the needs of the agency as they are? Yes. So we budget for the needs of the agency. Um, and until we fill those positions, we figure out ways to deliver those services at, at the highest level possible uh, with the staff cut that we have. And when we budget for 362 and don't fulfill or don't meet that number, uh, although it's a budgeted line item for sal PS, what happens to that surplus? It generally goes back to the, the general fund. Um, we have been, as you know, yes, we have had you know certain uh, some vacancies, and we have been able to use that those accruals from those vacancies as part of our efficiency savings that the administration has you know requested the agency to come up with a two percent or three percent of efficiency savings we have been able to use those savings from those vacant lines to support the agency but that's not a savings right that's yes it is a savings yes if we allocate a number a total dollar amount for PS and never fill those positions, and historically we have it. That's I, not I, a savings. That's overestimating and inflating so we can show not, not, a savings. No, it's not. Because, um, Mr. Chair, I just want to clarify one thing also. The fact that you're saying that we have a headcount of 362, this headcount was given to us as, you know, as part of the preliminary budget, we have that amount. Okay. But the, the lines, like take, for example, the construction safety training initiative, we got 44 lines for that. We're going to get to that, right. But right, but the agency cannot fill those lines within, you know, within a couple of weeks. Away. It, as the commissioner just mentioned, it takes a while. We have to advertise. We want to seek the best person for the job. So to judging the agency and saying that they have 362 lines that they have not been filled, it's not a fair statement that we should give them the opportunity to fill these positions. Prior to the construction safety yeah. question, mm -hmm. 44 additional employees that are needed. Mm -hmm. There's a, hold on, let me get to the point. The number of uh, workers and the cutback, is that it there? This is the There's the head count, okay. Right. Looking at the budget report I have here, you have 44 positions that were added for construction safety training initiative, correct? Correct. Okay. You have two that were added for the 100, th the 100,000 right. jobs. A CUNY, CUNY, a CUNY program. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You have one for DOE SBS transfer. Thank you. Yes. Okay. You have five for New York City at work. Yes. Then you have six that are lost to Center for Economic Opportunity Initiatives. Yes. Thirteen that were lost or have been removed right. from a need on career pathways reporting. Yes. An additional three from community development that were removed as positions that were needed. 30 or three? I'm sorry? Three. 
net giving you a net of 30. Oh, net, okay. Net of 30. Yes. On top, so three, that would mean you had allocated for 332 jobs prior to, you are, you are identifying 332 positions that are available within the agency aside from these adjustments that are made. Of that, how many employees do you currently have as full-time salaried employees? Um, well, you know, I, I saw the, the report here, but I, we need, as the commission said, I need to confirm these numbers. For okay. Because. I'll give you the number as of December from provided from OMB. That was 269. I, I so see. that is roughly 30, 60 off. Mm -hmm. In November, it was a total of 271 employees you had. In October, it was 272. In September, it was 269. Mm -hmm. In August, it was 267. In July, it was 269. You see the trend that we're going? We mm -hmm. never come near those numbers. So we inflate the budget to for an expense item of salaries that are not needed. Then you come back and say, oh, we just, did, we just saved 2% off our budget when it was just a increase in estimate that was a never going to be a realized expense to begin with. It looks more like a play on numbers more than transparency. Was that a, a statement? I, I'm, I'm asking, I'm, my perception of these numbers and digesting the steady number of work employees so, full time and the number that you are indicating you need okay. are not the same and ultimately we claim that when the actual budget or after the, uh, when the actual numbers are digested, we claim savings nope. and the money goes back to- No, that, no. that, that, is, yes. that is actually an uh, inaccurate statement. Okay, good, uh, so help me out. I, I did, I told you we budget for the needs of the agency and we continue to strive to hire as many people as possible. Now, if we are unable to do that, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we just stop looking for that person. We will continue to look for that person. But if there's six months of savings because we were supposed to hire somebody in July and we end up hiring that person in October, obviously that is, that is a, a realized savings. But and the SBS has been do. operating on, the, you're the commissioner of SBS for five years. I've and it's been, been operating for two years. I'm sorry, two years. You're right. Ten years at SBS. So mm -hmm. under the last two years, your agency has been operating, correct? So are you saying I'm doing a bad job in hiring? Because oh, no, that, I'm, I'm that, asking that is, you. That is certainly I'm asking you either we don't need to, those jobs or... Yes, we do need those jobs. Then how are you operating? We, we have staff that are working pretty hard to deliver high-quality services, and we will continue to do that while we continue to, to make sure that we do as much as possible to hire the right people in the right positions. Then can you help me, Commissioner, and, I, and I'm trying to get a better understanding here. The number of full-time employees you have today, can I have like a, do we have a breakdown of what their positions Is are? Is there a specific question in terms of, uh, you know, yeah. in terms of like, so we have a great staff at SBS. Uh, that Pro staff continues to women. do the work that uh, helps New Yorkers, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of specific employees, uh, I mean, what, what, what is the question that you're asking? Are we not hiring fast enough? We will continue to advertise and do as much as possible to hire the right people in the right jobs. I think it's remarkable the men and women that we have working in government, and I'm sure we have some very talented and hardworking men and women in the SBS in your agency. I just don't n understand how historically we budget or show a need for a certain number of employees that we never reach and claim that we need without having a disservice or an impact on the service that you provide. That's my question to you. So then if they're, and I'm sure they really are, you're pushing them to work harder and you're doing more with less, I'm guessing. Help me understand. Uh, I, th I think I've said it a couple of times. I have, and I've been tremendously blessed uh, with a team of hardworking individuals that will continue to try to deliver the highest level of service while we recruit 
for the right employees Good. at the agency. So then where are you short? Your agency and the numbers that you current, the vacancies that you have, where are they, where are you having those vacancies? Uh, they're scattered all across the agency. They're, you know, we have um, vacancies in um, the department, the, the Division of Economic and Financial Opportunity. We have the vacancies in business services. Do you know those numbers? How many? I just want to. No, we, we'll get back to you on those. Okay, on those information. I mean, you could also go on our website because we have all the job openings there, and you can help us with recruitment. That would be actually a great uh, a well, partnership with us. I'm looking forward to working on addressing the number of employees, yes, with you. Thank you. Do you know how many employees are currently working the vision of that oversee bids or work with bids? We have 26 employees. 26 employees specifically for bid? So, so uh, when you talk about bids, um, that specifically for the, if you're talking about the bid team, mm -hmm. there's six employees, but neighborhood development has uh, a total of 26 employees. 26 for neighborhood development with six that go that work for bids direct. Would, so but that would but be. let me just clarify: every single one of those employees in neighborhood development actually sits on. We have seventy-five bids, uh, so every single employee sit on the board representing the mayor. Uh, so the entire team is actually uh, the way we set up the. They have each uh, employee has a number of bids that they're responsible for in terms of making sure that they uh, attend all the bid meetings, uh, annual meetings, etc. Uh, but in terms of helping shepherd the process, the legislative process, in terms of dealing with um, either the bid creation uh, uh, process, dealing with uh, the, the community or the council members or the, uh, the steering committee, uh, there's six uh, individuals that are dedicated to that. There is a survey that I believe um, a small business survey that's being prepared Currently? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me, can you give me an update on that survey? So as you know, the, the law requires us to have that uh, report to council by 2019. Uh, we're in the process of actually uh, creating the questions um, and we'll, uh, we're on track to get that survey out by the uh, summer or fall. How far are you along with preparing that uh, survey? Uh, we're, we're right now in the process of developing the survey. Okay. Um, are you getting input from uh, businesses and business leaders uh, in preparation of the survey? Yes. Or is this being done just internally? No, we, we have, again, we're using our network of uh, community partners and also uh, the staff that work with small businesses and our uh, our uh, staff on the ground, we're sourcing questions for that survey. Okay, great. I know that we have some anxious uh, public testimony, and I'm trying to rush through this. As part of the fiscal 2019 plan, OMB requested the agency come up with a 2% efficiency savings. Is this correct? Correct. Can your, can the committee, can the agency, can you identify where you're coming up with the 2% savings and when whether it, they'll affect services in any way? So again, when we have efficiency savings, we try to minimize the impact on any of our services. Uh, so we try to spread it across the agency. Uh, we're still working out the details on that. Okay. And although at the OMB hearing, the director of OMB said that the mayor had asked for OMB to come up with an additional 5% savings as the executive budget, how does SBS plan to come up with that savings? If I, um, We have not been instructed. We yeah, we, we don't have that directive. At the same, at targets on, w, on MWBEs, the OMB here in the director of OMB mentioned that the city's goal to have 30% of the dollar value of city contracts go to certified MWBEs by 2021. Currently, 
we are at 12%. Is that correct? Uh, you're talking about the end of the last fiscal year? Yes. Yes. Okay. How much money is in the SBS budget in the current fiscal plan for the MWBE program? That's Is it six point? Is it six point three? Yeah, six point three million. What kind of services does the agency provide for MWBEs? So we're focused on certification and capacity building. Uh, so we are the city agency that is responsible for certifying that a company is uh, owned and controlled by an eligible member, um, and we also provide capacity building in terms of helping not only MWBEs build their capacity, but we also have programs uh, that connect them to financing, that connects them to uh, mentorship programs, uh, that also, um, uh, we also focus on helping prime contractors find uh, the right MWBs, and we also help uh, and working in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the Mayor's Office of uh, MWBE, ensuring that uh, we address any of the concerns that the MWBE community has. What further steps can be taken by your agency to ensure that we meet the goal of 30% by 2021? I think part of it is, uh, you know, obviously, we've, you know, uh, it's a commitment, it's a citywide commitment. So um, the mayor has done a great job in terms of ensuring that uh, all the commissioners are focused on increasing utilization of MWBE. I think, um, and, you know, in the last council session, uh, we had. Uh, advocates who helped us and uh, as the administration push uh, for uh, state legislation change. So now the city has more flexibility uh, in our discretionary spending. So we're now, uh, agencies have uh, the discretion of up to $150,000 um, in terms of uh, uh, discretionary micro purchases. I think that's going to be helpful uh, to increase the utilization of MWBs. Uh, certainly, we have to help MWBs um, actually. Uh, learn how to bid and also uh, do more effective business development with the different agencies. Uh, so we are looking at uh, providing additional services. So we not only provide them technical assistance on their bid response, uh, but we also make sure that we point them to the right agencies that are procuring the services that they need. Uh, are we on par to have the disparities, disparity study release for this month? We are working with the Office of MWB, so the, the data analysis portion is complete, um, and we're working with the Office of MWB on the release of the disparity study. On the contract services with EDC, uh, the 2019 preliminary budget for contract services with EDC is $22.2 million, representing a decrease of $19.5 million, or 46.7% from the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There's a $6.8 million decline in federal community development funds for this program area. That is a very special reason for the, is there a very special reason for this large decline? Um, I think that's a question for EDC. As yeah. I mentioned earlier, EDC negotiates the, the budget transaction directly with OMB. As, as Commissioner indicated, they are passed through our agency. Do you expect, uh, any additional federal community development funding to cover this gap, or is this just going to be negotiated? That's a that's a question for EDC. I'm sorry. That's it's a question, question for, for the EDC. EDC. Yep. Apart from any decline in federal funding, city city funding or state funding. What would be the impact of any federal, state, or city funding for this program area? Which program area? In particular, the federal community development funding to cover, I'm sorry, the federal community development funds. What areas would be greatly impacted by any cut to that area? What is the 
Uh, you're talking about the community, the community development block grants. Yes. Well, what is the what co what grants are provided through the federal community right. development? So, you, so yes, so you're talking about the community yeah. development block grants. Um, you know, clearly, if if there there are cuts in those areas, it may mean reduce grants to community organizations. How is your agency prepared to handle such cutbacks and such a, such a vital program? Uh, we're not. We're not. We're not. I mean, you know, if uh, certainly it's a conversation that we will have uh, with the budget office. Uh, we will strive to maintain uh, at least a, a same level of service. Um, but until we actually see the actual numbers, because uh, the federal government uh, budget is still has not been passed yet, so uh, we're not able to, uh, you know, uh, answer that question at this time. But I mean the. But what I've told the team is that, you know, depending on where the cuts are, we try to minimize the impact it has on our services. Let me go back to some of the new initiatives. Under the waterfront permit unit, I believe there is a request for 200,000. That's correct. Files from fiscal 2018 to fiscal 2019. Yes. Okay. What is the purpose of that funding? It, what's that? So it's uh, to install some tech. So as you know, SBS is responsible for permitting on the waterfront, and I believe some of that dollars is to um, uh, procure technology uh, to make it easier and faster for our plan examiners to uh, work with companies that are looking for a permit. Why does waterfront permits unit fall in the SBS to begin with? That is a, a history. The, it's the history of the agency. We uh, were formerly the uh, Ports and Trades. Um, this goes way back to what the 70s, I think, uh, or even before. Um, so that is a that is a function of um, of, of SBS past. Is there is there reason to believe that this? Waterfront permitting unit will always be in the, uh, uh, in the, I guess, in your responsibility in the small business services. Uh, we are having conversations right now with the Department of Buildings. Uh, there's a series of steps that needs to be taken. For example, Department of Buildings is right now developing a waterfront code uh, to enforce, um, and then we are uh, in, com in uh, uh, conversations in terms of transferring the responsibility of permitting. Uh, from SBS uh, to the Department of Buildings. Uh, that is um, uh, some ways away. Uh, so until then, we have to continue providing that service. So then if we're eventually moving to have the Waterfront Permits Unit become part of DOB uh, as they develop the Waterfront Code, why would we invest 200000 into IT development knowing that that unit will no longer may not need that IT and it'll be a part of a much larger that's, agency. Th that's inaccurate. They will continue, they will need to have that, that, that technology. Um, and certainly we are working to make sure that that technology is compatible with uh, what the Department of Buildings is, work, is using currently. So uh, that, but, but until then, uh, they still have to continue doing their jobs. Um, so we want to make sure we provide uh, the best uh, uh, service to um, uh, New Yorkers. So the IT upgrade that we're seeking will will be assured that they'll be able to communicate between the Department of Building Systems and the waterfront permit. We are we are in close communication with the Department of Buildings to make sure that whatever we do currently uh, will not be lost. Okay. Can you help explain the construction safety training uh, program? So we are responsible for helping over 6,000 firms um, in, in terms of uh, getting their uh, employees uh, trained uh, to match uh, the uh, curriculum that is de designed uh, by the task force. Um, and as you know, this is all uh, focused on ensuring the safety of construction workers. Explain the role that <laughs> you foresee SBS having where 44 new positions will be needed to meet the functions of this Well, we're, <clears throat> we're, we're talking about 40 to 50,000 individuals that need to be trained. Will be trained by the new 44 
What? Is, well, hold on. Who's going to do the training? So it's a combination of uh, local organizations, uh, SBS, uh, and we're still in uh, program design. Um, so again, the, those numbers could change, but we're, we're trying to figure out the most effective way uh, to actually get and accomplish this aggressive goal, uh, which is to train such a large number of people in a short period of time. Uh, so we're looking at every single option. Aren't there currently programs that and training that it, and courses that are being offered um, already? We, yes, and we are also considered. So, not there are training providers, uh, but Sorry. there there are training providers out there that certainly we are talking to, mm -hmm. um, and they are part of the strategy. Uh, but remember, this is forty to fifty thousand individuals, so there is a capacity issue. Um, so we are looking to figure out ways of addressing that. I don't know if uh, First Deputy J Jackie Mellon could add to that. Yeah. <clears throat> and actually, the the curriculum, um, the required curriculum, is still being defined by DOB. And so, you, you're right; it's possible that there are existing trainings, but this is brand new, um, and so all new trainings will have to be approved and be consistent with what the Department of Buildings uh, and based on the recommendations of their task force, require. What is the anticipated funding for this initiative in 2019 preliminary? It's eight, or it's a- In 19, a, it's 18.7. And it's- uh, For the total initiative, the total it's a multi-year- It's currently like 63.4.9, sorry, 63.9. Over four years. Over four and a half years. Yeah. Four and a half years, so. Yeah. Okay. And on Apprentice NYC, can you tell me more about the initiative? Uh, yes, I would be happy to tell you more about the initiative. It stems from the, the Mayor's 100K Jobs um, uh, plan, and um, the, it's a public-private uh, partnership in which we are employing um, apprentice-like training models to put people into uh, skilled positions in partnership with um, industry. We're going to focus on industrial manufacturing, tech, and healthcare. Does that conflict at all, or does that overlap with uh, the 100,000 new jobs through CUNY, or Workforce One, or Career Paths, it's or? It's complementary. Right. I'm sorry? It's complementary. It's complementary. Yes. Okay. Um, my last question for you is, what is a citywide re-estimates? What does what re-estimates mean? I... Where are you? I'm looking at this, and it's a definition of well, it's an explanation of what happens in the November plan, which includes re-estimates in personal service and other than, or OTPS. Explain re-estimates in the calculations. I, would you be so kind? This is, I'm sure you're drawing from this report. Could you just... Uh, Provide the page number that you're looking at. It'd be better, easier to understand what you're asking. I'm sorry. What's the page number that you're on? Page number in this report. I think I think you're drawing from this report. Yes. Okay. Which page number are you referring to? Because I'm easier. not sure. I saw it in there as re-estimates. Okay. Just then. Hold on one second. Let's see. If we can find it. Page five. Look we'll at page five. It's where you have the 2% savings. Oh, these are the, these are efficiency savings, right? Oh. Oh, those, those are the efficiency savings. Yeah. What are they called? Efficiency savings. What is the, the, what, that's what we talked about where uh, as part of the overall uh, city strategy to reduce costs. And so OMB, uh, we talked about the 2% um, uh, efficiency savings uh, where we try to figure out ways to save dollars. I know that we have a le an eager uh, public well and ready and uh, have been very patient and I apologize, but I'm gonna just wrap it up with, we've got a lot of good work to do ahead of us, uh, ahead of us, uh, Commissioner. I'm looking forward to the challenges that we're gonna meet together. I know that um, it's not gonna be easy to meet the needs of the SBS, but I'm looking forward to working alongside of you to improve the 
environment that our small business, in particular our micro businesses, and to ensure that all of your resources are dedicated and committed to specifically helping preserve uh, the business climate, uh, not only enticing new businesses, but preserving the existing businesses while creating the jobs uh, that pay decent salaries uh, that makes New York such a wonderful place to live, thrive, and invest. So thank I you. I just want to thank you, Commissioner. And looking forward to working with you as well. Thank you. All right. Just on a record, I'll take a two-minute break if it's okay with you, and then we'll be right back to the public uh, testimonies.
So this begins the uh, public hearing part of uh, today, and I call up, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, if I could read it, Demis Demopoulos. There you go. Say that again. Demos Demopoulos. And you're going to bring the chairman up with you, and that would be uh, Daniel Gallo. Perfect. We'll have you both uh, sit, at, take a seat at the table there. I just want to thank you for your patience, and um, I promise you that this is the opportunity that's afforded to you to, sp to discuss with us, and not only discuss, but you'll be heard on the issues that impact you, and I'm grateful to you for your, your time and your patience on this Friday afternoon. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman John Hodge, and uh, Council Member Perkins. I've sat at this table a few times over my years as a Teamster. It's my 40th year uh, this year. I am uh, executive officer of Teamsters Local 553, one of the oldest Teamster locals in New York, representing about 6,000 members. And I'm also secretary treasurer of Joint Council 16, representing 120,000 Teamsters, where George Miranda is our president. He sends his regards, by the way. I spoke with him earlier today. And I apologize for our casual dress, but we only found out at 10 o'clock this morning that we would be here today, but it's an important issue, and uh, we want to make sure that we made it. And first of all, I just want to make a comment on, on the questions that you asked and uh, asking for accountability from SBS, and uh, it's great to see. Um, I applaud SBS and all the work that they do. Uh, we have a lot of issues where we overlap. The only thing I work with a much smaller budget, but my main issue for being here is, as you may know, is a school bus issue. We represent over 2,000, in our local, over 2,000 school bus drivers. And while Reliant, which has been spoken of much today, is a, is a U.S and Canadian company, and it's the largest privately held transportation company within those two countries. We represent about 10 or 11 uh, school bus companies here based in the five boroughs. The owners live in the five boroughs. All their employees live in the five boroughs. So we see it as a little bit of a conflict that SBS would be concerned about Reliant and you hit it right on the head with the questions that you asked about how they were the only ones that get the grant. Um, my president here, Danny Gatto, knows more of the technicalities as to why other companies did not uh, apply for the grant. I think there were certain conditions tied to it that prevented them from doing that. But basically what this did was make an unlevel playing field. We're burdened with negotiating with these owners of these companies for the employees to protect their wages, to protect their medical benefits, to protect their pensions, their way of life. Again, in, uh, people that live here in this city. 
as do the employees of Reliant. I recognize that. And I have great respect for 1181, the, uh, the union that represents them. But when others have to compete with this work and it's one-sided, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Again, uh, what's happening is when we negotiate, the employees are looking from us to give back cut back on the wages, and nobody can afford to do that, or to pay for part of their medical. Uh, you may recall that two years ago in the papers, we were very, very close to having a strike at one of our bus companies over that very if issue of paying towards their medical. And I know that some people do in the private sector. We're fortunate that not many of our members do, but we're very responsible. We're not strike happy. We always try and work out solutions. When healthcare costs go up, we try and figure other ways to contain those costs, changing the plan, uh, raising co-pays. This way, not everybody's burdened with it every week out of their paycheck. And it seems like there's less and less all the time. And we try and be very protective of it. And that's why we advocate uh, against uh, this measure of the, of, the, uh, of the grants and have been. But unfortunately, um, when there was a previous hearing uh, by one of your president, uh, predecessor uh, council members, uh, Dan Gorodnik was there and testified against the grant and myself uh, testified against it, but it still went through, still went through. So I have a question for you. Is it that Reliance is too big to fail, that they have to support? Is there enough industry players out there that could pick up the slack? Or without Reliance, we would have children that wouldn't have transportation options to get to school, creating chaos for families? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, my, my, w between our local, uh, another team to local, 917, uh, between uh, one particular independent union, uh, there may be another 10,000, altogether 10,000 school bus drivers working. So there always seems to be enough people. Plus you have, as was mentioned today, the uh, master list where unemployed uh, school bus drivers are, are on that the employers can draw from. So, so there's we, always enough of a workforce. There's always a shortage of drivers because people retire and sometimes people don't want to do this kind of job. But actually it's a great job for someone that uh, is retired from another industry that wants to supplement their income. So the, the question is the, the safety of our children and the transportation options that we provide to them to and from school is not in jeopardy if this particular company Correct. would not be a provider. Correct, all of our other employers, and I'm sure the other unions that, that I speak of, uh, all their employees are vetted. Uh, they have to be, they have to be certified by the uh, Department of Education in order to do those jobs, and they're trained in those jobs. So a simple question, can you think of a good reason for Reliance to receive this grant and where no other entity or other group has received it or been able to apply for it or did apply for it? N none whatsoever. And really, as a, as a citizen, I'm a little bit taken back, and I don't mean to criticize uh, SBS, but they're giving all this grant money, yet there's no oversight. You know, another entity is overseeing how that money's spent. And basically, with the way we feel about it, all that money is doing is subsidizing this company to be the lowest bidder. And I'll use the term, bid rigging. It's as simple as that. You kind of touched on it a little bit too, Mr. Chairman, without saying it. <laughs> Thank you. This is no knock on 1181. You know, they're a good union. They represent their members well. And we're certainly not here to say, uh, to try to steal members from them. These members were, were mostly 1181 members prior to the bid, but the, Reliant was allowed to come in and underbid and basically willing to pay less wages and benefits to those drivers and, and school bus workers and 
yet be rewarded by giving grant money. So the city say they save $45 million by putting this work out to bid, yet they've spent $100 million subsidizing it. When there were many other contractors who are good players, who struggle to pay benefits and, and negotiate with unions on the way, wait for wages and, and benefits, uh, who were not afforded the same same rights. They just, they were, there was no way that they could uh, competitively bid facing those obstacles. And whatever union they belonged to, whatever union those workers belonged to or those companies had contracts with, were all, uh, 1181 included, they were all faced with the same problem. It's a shame that uh, the most precious cargo that's being transported is children and the job always goes to the lowest bidder. What would have happened to the, your men and women that are currently working, the 2,000, is that what I understood, 2,000? Yeah, uh, are working for how many entities in the uh, city? Um, about many? 10 entities. About, yeah, about 10. About, about 10. 10 companies. And they're currently being paid and they have the benefits and the packages that uh, they've been entitled to and have been negotiated. There hasn't been a scale back of any sort. Well, cer certainly some have and some haven't. We have what we refer to as legacy contractors that uh, have ongoing contracts with the city that have been extended over the years. And then we have other companies that have procured work under some of the new bids that have, le have left kind of a lot of the um, uh, benefits that some of the other contractors get. Uh, they don't get that. So are you saying that you have members that currently don't have benefits that are being provided have, to them? They have different benefits and a different level of compensation than some of the older, so the older ones do. As we said before, we'd had to make adjustments in plans to make it affordable still for the employer on the money that he gets from the city, but yet make sure that our members still have medical coverage without having to pay for part of and it. So this, this grant could have been very helpful to some of those families. Absolutely. Could have been, could have been. The whole idea was to put a Band-Aid or to rectify the problems with losing the EPPs, but it didn't work. It, it became one-sided and only one employer benefited because of it. And you're looking for a little stability, I would imagine, and yes. clear transparency and making sure that the playing field is equal for all. Exactly. While protecting the men and women that you represent. Exactly. It benefits all the employers equally and of course the employees. Yeah, it's not unique to Local 553. This has happened across the whole industry. Thank you, gentlemen, unless there's something else you want to bring to our attention. No, but thank no, you very thank much you. for your time. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Donald Ranstick. Was Donald here? There you go. Okay. While we're at it, why don't we bring the rest up? Uh, I have Lena, Afridi, Jesse, Jesse Lehman. Michael Brady. I'm sorry, is Jose, is that, Jose here? Lehman, no. And yes. Lena? No. Eric Kim. Is three minutes okay for you as uh, your state? Perfect. 
Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chairman Jonai. Yeah, it's on. It's on, yep. My wife teases me because she says I need glasses, and now I know what she's talking about. I, she's always right anyway. <laughs> I'm Donald Ranchty, Senior Vice President, President of the <coughs> Building Trades Employers Association. We represent 26 construction trade associations and 1,200 uh, unionized contractors across the city. We appear today to ask this committee to continue to examine and question the administration's proposal in the SBS budget <clears throat> to allot $64 million over the next four years for construction safety training. This funding is supposedly allocated for initiatives associated with implementation of Local Law 196. When passed last year, Local Law 196 required safety training for all construction workers. We view this as a mandate on private businesses, construction contractors, to train their own workforce. In fact, BTA contractors already pay for safety training for their workforce. <clears throat> As part of their collective bargaining agreements, our contractors pay, their, uh, pay the safety training fees and buy the equipment associated with safety for their workers. Contractors should be paying for their workforce safety training. With that said, we understand that there are still unique challenges presented by the needs of day laborers in New York City and those who do not have the ability to pay. We have been supportive of a pledge by the administration to allocate $5 million for those uh, uh, construction workers who are not able to pay or are day laborers, in fact, and uh, <clears throat> we will continue to support that. However, this, this money is appropriated to CBOs to start the program, and we expect that non-union contractors will utilize the training for their workforce at no expense to themselves and subsidized by the city. It most certainly should not be made an annual appropriation by the city over the next four fiscal years when the bill um, and the law, Local Law 196, sunsets in 2020, worst case scenario. Um, actually, the last milestone for training is September 2019, but the Department of Buildings can extend that for six months into 2020. We have heard that some contractors are already withholding wages to pay for safety training, so they're not paying their employees. This is reprehensible and should not be allowed to happen. We can't have the city subsidizing contractors who don't care enough to pay for the life safety training for their workers. We ask that you continue to ask questions about why 69, I'm sorry, $64 million will be allocated over the next four years and why SBS and the city feels that they um, should hire 44 staff members associated with this for four years when the bill sunsets in two. I have 15 seconds, thank you. Those are some great questions and I promise you that we'll follow up with them and I have your written testimony, so thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I think I'm next. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Lehman. I am, the, I am the Director of Policy at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, the coalition represents all of the groups in New York City that provide uh, job placement or job training, workforce development services to New Yorkers, and that's a broad coalition that includes community colleges, labor management organizations, uh, and uh, a wide array of community-based organizations, local CBOs, that provide job placement services for people in the neighborhood. There are 180 members of the coalition. Uh, and our members uh, primarily serve New Yorkers with higher needs of job training in order to get good quality jobs. Uh, they're not people, by and large, that are ready for work today, but that need either literacy, numeracy, or English language assistance, or other basic job skills to be able to get a good job. Uh, and so we want to advocate for a city program, a city services in general through SBS, that support workforce development aimed at the people with the greatest need. Uh, and the good news is that the Mayor's Career Pathways Plan recognized the need for this. Uh, four years ago, Career Pathways became the blueprint for workforce development services in New York City and was aimed at providing services for people with greater need. However, it is woefully underfunded and SBS as an agency that should be taking the lead in driving some of the priorities of Career Pathways has not done enough. Uh, we have two areas of concern in particular that we wanted to raise today with SBS related to career pathways. Uh, first and, and top uh, is the budgetary concern related to the preliminary budget here. Um, the career pathways plan promised, one, uh, promised $60 million, $60 million annually by 2020 
for bridge programs. I won't go into the long definition of bridge programs, but they're programs that help people who need basic skills. Uh, as of the current budget, uh, the city is only spending less than $10 million on bridge programming. Uh, we need to know how much SBS is going to contribute to the $60 million goal by next year, and if they're not contributing all $60 million, and I don't think they will be, uh, what other agencies they're expecting to refer people to to get this basic training. And then the other question area that we would love to see this committee follow up and do oversight on, and I want to thank uh, your colleague uh, who's no longer here, uh, Councilwoman Rivera, raised this question earlier in, in the testimony uh, by SBS, uh, which is who is receiving SBS Workforce One services now? Uh, we really don't have a good answer to whether or not the Workforce One system is serving people who have barriers to employment, the formerly incarcerated, recent immigrants, people with disabilities, the long-term unemployed, and so on. Uh, we don't think that they are serving those people, certainly not well enough and with enough services, and we think that this committee could force them to report on that. Uh, there was a bill last year, Intro 1736, uh, that has not been reintroduced yet, and that's something that this committee could look into. Uh, those are the two areas, and I, of course, I'd be happy to answer questions, and you have my, my written testimony. I have. I want to thank you for your time, and I promise you'll be looking into intro 1736, last, correct? Last year, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you to City Council's Committee on Small Business and Chair uh, Jonai for providing us the opportunity to submit this testimony. Uh, my name is Eric Kim, and I'm the Small Business Project Manager at the Asian American Federation. Asian, Asian American Federation's mission is to raise the influence and well-being of the pan-Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and organizational development. We also come to you today representing our network over 60 member organizations, supporting our community with their work in health and human services, education, economic development, civic participation, and social justice. Asian-owned small businesses are a vibrant and essential part of the city's economy, accounting for about um, about half of net new economic activity and half of net new paid employment from 2002 to 2012 in New York City. Many of these businesses are important sources of jobs for new Asian immigrants. Despite this impressive statistics, many of these entrepreneurs face challenges due to language, barriers, confusing regulations, and dearth of programming to address their specific needs. While their economic output is celebrated, the city's Asian entrepreneurs have difficulty finding the support and resources they need to truly thrive. Asian American Federation is developing programming out of our new EDC-funded office in Flushing, where we are focused on the small business on Union Street who were negatively impacted by the construction of Flushing Commons. This support includes followings. Uh, marketing, we are currently providing marketing assistance, social media education, community engagement, and beautification projects, media coverage. And we also urge the city to consider creating workforce development programs that focus on the needs of small businesses and the immigrant labor force. With half of Asian New Yorkers struggling with LEP and one in four living in poverty, we need to provide programs that address their diverse needs and help them climb the economic ladder. Instead, funding, funding language training for non-English speakers has lagged in the face of increasing demand for services in the Asian community. In addition to the workforce development programs that our member agencies, Asian American Federation also has worked with state to conduct health and safety trainings in the nail salon industry. We re-granted funds to our partner agencies who have been organizing workers in the industry so that they are trusted leaders conduct the much needed trainings. To strengthen this important pieces of New York City's econo economic engine, we request the committee and city council to consider the following recommendations. We have seven recommendations, but I just want to point out one recommendation. The others, uh, I'm, I will be more than happy to have a meeting or go over the details uh, if, uh, as your request. One of the recommendations that I do want to point out is that the fund programs like the Capital Access Program as a way to incentivize loans to small business. And, uh, and this is, I, I believe this is one of the important recommendations that we should uh, look into. And uh, please feel free to ask me any questions if you have. Thank you. I do have your written testimony and we will be following up with you. Yes, sir. Um, to go through this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai, Councilmember Perkins. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. 
A uh, special thank you to the SBS staff, specifically Assistant Commissioner Goddard, who has stuck around. It's been a long hearing, so I appreciate that. I'm Michael Brady, Executive Director of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District, located in the South Bronx. The Third Avenue bid is the Bronx's oldest bid, has approximately 200 member businesses that include small, emerging, and micro businesses, some locally owned mom and pops, others are larger franchises, a healthy mix of destination and convenience retailers and service providers. Our business count is slated to grow to 900 by 2019 and greets over 200,000 visitors daily. We have an assessment-driven operating budget of $426,000. We employ four individuals full-time and supervise contracted supplemental maintenance and security services, an additional staff of six. As you may recall, on February 28th, I delivered testimony during the oversight hearing into the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I want to make it very clear that SBS is a partner to the city's business improvement districts. I also want to make it very clear that partners, in order to strengthen the fabric of the city, should give honest criticism to not just move an agency forward, but to move the city as a whole forward. I would like to further clarify for some members of the council, the administration, and agency partners that partners do not use the term bite the hand that feed you. Partners are just that, partners, and exist symbiotically. There are several career public servants at SBS, and I want them to know they are valued, trusted, and respected. During the hearing, it was established that the agency had a fiscal year budget of roughly $191 million and employed just over 300 employees. While I realize these numbers have changed, it does not alter the fact that the agency has programs that seek to enhance the fabric of micro, emerging, and small businesses throughout the city, and that there was a willingness to partner with the city council to strengthen those programs and work with on-the-ground organizations to provide localized practices to specific communities. The Third Avenue Business Improvement District would recommend the following areas of improvement. Data and staffing. SBS should create a staffing plan that maximizes existing strengths and seeks to ensure that high turnover rates and vacancies are minimized. SBS should utilize specific resources to streamline data collection processes and uh, CRM so that staffing may be better utilized for frontline service provision instead of data interpretation and collection. These resources should also be made available to all SBS partners, including bids, so that data sets like vacancies, uh, district employment statistics, number of micro business and workforce data, and district spending and impact can be better understood. Secondly, SBS should expand the number of staff members allocated to business improvement districts, specifically in the areas, areas of specific, uh, bid specific intergovernmental relations and bid capacity building. Several bids were formed under the past administration that need significant assistance to, quote, right themselves. The Third Avenue bid was one of those districts. I'm happy to report that we're no longer. However, there are still eight to 10 districts citywide that would benefit from deeper capacity assistance. Secondly, fund for equitable business courses and workshop offerings. Apologize, I'm going slightly over. With appropriate partnership and resource distribution, these should be offered more equitably in the outer boroughs. We realize that it may be difficult to engage with outer borough businesses, but this is also the very reason more resources should be distributed particularly to established businesses that need enhanced programming to keep, compete with e-commerce, big box stores, and, high, uh, and the high impact of commercial taxes. In reviewing the SBS published workshop and business course distribution that's published through their website, we found that over the next two months, 37 business courses will be offered in Manhattan, 19 in Brooklyn, 17 in Queens, five in the Bronx, and zero in Staten Island. We did not find any marketing materials or translation, translation offerings for these workshops to address uh, Council Member Diaz's point at the last hearing. Thirdly, widespread use of Chamber on the Go. Expand Chamber on the Go services to all businesses, not just businesses outside the purview of business improvement districts. And lastly, in addition to the very concrete items I mentioned, I would also ask this council to investigate what the effect a loss of federal C CDBG funding would have on SBS programs and what safeguards are in place to address that. These programs are vital to on-the-ground partner executed services and comply, com comprise roughly 30% of SBS program budgets. Furthermore, Given SBS's experience and general trends in New York City, I would like to have this council see how funding may be reallocated to address commercial warehousing, commercial tax reductions, and enhancing tools and funding to the seven to nine ch chambers and 75 bids to assist with the marketing and participation in Chamber on the Go. I know that many individuals, organizations, and groups have strong opinions on the role of business improvement districts, including the opinions of this administration that bids lead to gentrification. 
Some people welcome business improvement districts, others do not. However, I traditionally don't weigh in either, on either side of the argument because the Bronx and most outer boroughs represent a different model to typical bids. You see, in my district, we don't have the luxury of completing major capital projects, traveling abroad to scout the latest trends in bus shelter development, or elaborate streetscape pro programs, largely because our programs are making up for over five decades of community disinvestment. Many bids in historically underser underserved and under-resourced communities are doing similar work. Our communities have never had a real seat at the table and have slowly developed a bid framework that works for us and works for the communities that we serve, a framework that protects our communities. And by communities, I mean all members, our businesses, our property owners, our residents, our homeless, our developers, and the individuals from suffering from mental illness and substance abuse. All are part of our community fabric, all deserve a voice, and all are represented in this conversation. It's my hope that this brief conversation today can provide the tools to provide a clearer course for business development in New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your time. For those of you who don't have it, I'll give you my card for a follow-up. Omar Frila, Usman Ahmed, Ruth Lopez, Saduf Sil. Good afternoon, yes. Chairperson Jonich and um, members of the Small Business Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sadaf Sial. I'm with the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, uh, also known as NICNOC. And on behalf of NICNOC and the 13 organizations that make up the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, um, we uh, would like to just be here today to speak a little bit about the successes of that initiative thus far and the benefits that worker cooperatives offer to uh, low-income communities across the city. Um, and so you may know that worker cooperatives are businesses that are owned and controlled by those that work in them. Uh, because of that and because they are set up that way, they offer a real opportunity for economic advancement. Um, they offer workers uh, the opportunity to share in the benefits of the business, share profits, um, to control their working conditions, and to have a say in the day-to-day -day, uh, of, their, of their business. Um, and um, it is really a, a model that has proven to be effective for creating and ma maintaining stable and dignified jobs, generating wealth, improving the quality of life of workers, and promoting community and local economic de development, particularly for people who lack access to business ownership or sustainable work options. Um, and so under the initiative, the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, uh, in the first three completed fiscal years of it, it has led to the creation of 84 cooperatives uh, across New York City um, and also over 500 worker owner positions. Um, it has also provided uh, over 3,000 technical assistance services to those businesses and more. And in addition, it, uh, many of the partners work to uh, to do a lot of education and outreach uh, across different communities, to different allied organizations, to entrepreneurs that are also interested in forming worker cooperatives, um, to provide them with support um, and information on how to do that. Um, and so this, this current fiscal year, uh, we are requesting a slight increase. Uh, in the last fiscal year, the initiative received about three million, a bit over $3 million in funding, and we are hoping in the next fiscal year uh, uh, for $3.95 million. Uh, and this is to you know, continue to grow worker cooperative businesses in the city, create even more uh, new worker owner positions, and bring in some new organizations um, into the initiative that have been doing this work and are interested in doing this work because that interest has really grown uh, amongst organizations, unions, uh, academic institutions, and so we're, we're hoping to support some of that. Um, and, um, and just to say that we have worked very closely with SBS, 
for that initiative over the past three years um, with successes in terms of in them integrating worker cooperatives into the services that they, they offer and provide. Uh, there's more room to grow there and we hope to continue to build on that relationship with SBS. Um, but yes, um, so with the continued support of City Council and the support of uh, SBS, we, uh, we hope that these businesses will continue to grow and that we witness more individuals and families achieving the financial stability that will ultimately improve not only their lives but the broader community as well. Um, and so we hope that you consider our budget priorities and recommendations during this year's budget process and thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Gonage. Councilman Perkins, good to see you back. My name is Omar Freya. I'm the founder and coordinator of Green Worker Cooperatives. We are an organization based in the Bronx dedicated to the creation of worker cooperatives. Most of our, about half of our participants, people who go through our programs, aspiring entrepreneurs, are coming from the Bronx. Other, are, others are coming from other parts of the city, all over the city. We, uh, along with the partners, our partners in the initiative, are here to, to request an enhancement to the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative. It has been incredibly successful. We have worked uh, tirelessly to really create opportunities for people who have ideas for businesses to turn those ideas into realities. The, the fact that they are coming together as worker cooperatives is in the face of a climate that uh, really is completely ambivalent and, and uninformed about the existence of this business structure, which creates opportunities that were just outlined, but really create a ways for people to pool their resources and create businesses where they weren't before. That is something that for our members and the, our participants, people who are coming to us, they are really able to put in the work. We run a, a five-month-long business academy and it's something that has allowed people to really come together and create their ideas. So they're coming together in spite of the fact that there aren't many resources for people. So when people ask, why aren't there more of these, these cooperatives if these are such great ideas, why isn't everyone running a worker co-op? The simple fact that the money is not, does not go in that direction. So if you are an investor looking to put money into a business, you wouldn't put it into a worker cooperative because you're looking to extract as much, you're looking to get as much profit as you can from the business. And it's also, that means that it's not something that's talked about, which is really the biggest factor. It's not something that you learn in business school, it's not something that's taught, it's not something that business entrepreneurship programs engage in. So the fact that our organizations, those that are part of this initiative are promoting this, is in the face of all of that. And what we've seen is that just in the past three years of the initiative, we've been able to have incredible results to the point that now we have more and more people, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs who are reaching out, community organizations from all over the city, saying that they want, they want this, they want to be a partner, and they want to engage in this. And what we're here is to say that this has been incredibly successful, we see it growing, and this is an opportunity to build the capacity so that we can see even more of these kinds of cooperatives. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your testimony. And um, I'm just going to translate for Ruth at the end of her testimony because she'll be speaking in Spanish. Um, buenas tardes, eh, distinguidos miembros del Comité de Pequeños Negocios de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Ruth López Martínez. Uh, soy una de las dueñas de la cooperativa Palante Green Cleans. Y soy una migrante que llegó a este país hace 12 años. Tal vez la mitad de mi vida vivida aquí en este país fue muy difícil. Fue muy difícil encontrar eh, un trabajo con dignidad, un trabajo con salarios justos. Y no solamente yo, sino cada una de las compañeras de mi cooperativa tuvimos este gran problema en esta ciudad. Era muy difícil. Eh, trabajar y sentirnos personas dignas debido a, a no tener un salario justo. Sin embargo, a pesar de que hubo compañeros que inclusive tenían hace tres años atrás, hace cuatro años atrás, salarios entre tres y cinco dólares la hora 
y con esa gran dificultad seguimos adelante hasta encontrar este sueño llamado con la cooperativa Palante. Palante es una cooperativa que nació hace tres años, estamos en el mercado hace tres años y es, es un negocio cooperativo que nos ha hecho cambiar la vida. Hoy nos sentimos personas dignas y orgullosas del trabajo que realizamos porque somos respetados porque tenemos nuestro propio negocio, porque tenemos nuestros propios clientes que nos respetan y estamos en este momento recibiendo un salario justo con el cual podemos vivir con dignidad en la ciudad de Nueva York y podemos ayudar a nuestros familiares en, nuestro, en nuestras ciudades, en nuestros países, que al fin y al cabo ese fue el sueño por el cual estuvimos aquí. Sin embargo, este camino no lo hemos recorrido solos, eh, ha sido una gran ayuda de ustedes, de organizaciones como el Centro de la Vida Familiar, como el Centro de Justicia Urbana, como NINOC y otras organizaciones que nos han ayudado a capacitarnos en la parte de finanzas, en la parte de negocios, en la parte de contabilidad y además nos han ayudado a crecer como personas para sentirnos hoy orgullosos como nos sentimos. Pero como nada es completo, como digo yo, aún faltan muchas cosas por hacer. Nos faltan muchas cosas realmente para alcanzar ese sueño de tener que, des que para decir que tenemos una gran compañía. En este momento nos hemos reunido eh, con otras cooperativas y vemos que la necesidad de espacio, de un lugar donde hacer nuestra labor es, es algo que estamos necesitando en forma urgente. Además de eso, tenemos un gran sueño. Queremos contratar con la ciudad. Creo que serían unos clientes fabulosos y, y, y queremos que ese sueño nos, se nos cumpla en algún momento. Eh, queremos que nos den la oportunidad de seguir charlando con ustedes, de seguir comunicándonos con ustedes para que hablemos sobre estas cosas que queremos. Eh, un espacio, contratar con la ciudad y muchas otras cosas que estamos necesitando para poder seguir adelante para ayudar a otras cooperativas que ya están, para ayudar a cooperativas nuevas, a inmigrantes y a pequeños negocios. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad. Gracias, señorita López. ¿Quieres traducir eso? Sí, no va a ser tan bueno, Mi nombre es Ruth López. Soy uno de los trabajadores de la Palante Green Cleaning Cooperative. Soy un inmigrante que ha estado en este país por 12 años. Inicialmente, vivir en este país fue muy difícil. To obtain a dignified job with a fair wage was very difficult for me and my colleagues of the cooperative. We have some folks who just three years ago were making three to five dollars an hour. It was very difficult to live with those wages in New York before we found our dream called Palante. We started the Palante Cooperative around three years ago and we have been able to totally change our lives. Firstly, we have our own company, ours, where we can count on respect among fellow workers and where we earn fair wages which allow us to live with dignity in New York and help our families. The organizations that are helping us in this process of starting our own cooperative, like the Center for Family Life, the Urban Justice Center, and NICNOC, have helped us not only in our work, but also as individuals, building our capacities around legal and managerial aspects of the business and helping us feel proud of what we've achieved with our cooperative. Without fail, still more is needed. We have identified things like space as something that we need, a place where we can conduct our business better, more efficiently. To contract with city agencies is also a dream of ours that we aim to reach. This is why I'm here. First, to thank you for the support that has helped us to get where we are. And secondly, so that you remember us and continue to support the needs we still have. We hope to connect with you all to maximize our dream called Palante and to help other immigrants and small business owners. Thank you. Your testimony has been heard and I will be following up with you. I have cards for you as a follow up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Vital and Umberto Restrepo. Thank you, Chair. 
Jonah, my name is Humberto Restrepo. I'm representing the Joint Industry Board of the Electrical Industry. The JIB is a, is a labor management organization founded in 1943. It is comprised of local union number three of the International Brotherhood of, of, of Electrical Workers, the New York chapter of the National Electrical Contractors Association, and the Association of Electrical Contractors, Inc. The JIB is the ERISA administrator for family of multi-employer benefits plans serving local, local three and its affiliated contractors in the greater New York City area. Local three has over 28,000 members of which 1,200 work as electricians for over 300 employers. For 75 years, the JIB has provided thousands of New York City residents the opportunity to develop the skills needed to become New York State certified electricians. The JIB supported the enactment, the enactment of Local Law 196 of 2017 that calls for more stringent construction safety training requirements. The law goes a long way in reversing the rise of construction site deaths and severe accidents. It will help provide better protection for the public at large and construction workers whose jobs by nature are hazardous. The JIB is proud of its long and rich history of providing leading electrical industry training through our apprenticeship program and continuing skills and safety enhancement courses. Our, in, our industry's commitment to skill and safety training is a significant financial obligation borne by our signatory contractors as part of their collective bargaining agreement with Local 3. The biggest issue that we have, Chair, Chairman, is that Local 3 and the contractors, they've always been the forefront of safety on the construction site. When this bill was introduced, we didn't have a problem with some seed money to help some non-for-profit and certain uh, community organizations help with certain individuals that don't have access to this kind of training. But the, under the SBS budget, they're allocating over $60 million, we feel, to train our competition. Our contractors spend tens of thousands of dollars to educate our membership. And I don't know or we don't understand why they need 44 new hires when in the fiscal impact statement when this local law was first introduced, the city estimated that maybe 4,000 workers will fall on, under this kind of uh, access requirement. Now we're up to, according to, to the commissioner's testimony this morning or, or this afternoon, 40 to 50,000 workers. We see that as a direct undermining of, of what we do as an industry and makes, it makes it a lot more difficult for our contractors to be competitive when our competitors, they're being subsidized by city money to train a workforce that it's their workforce. This law was, was enacted to ensure that employees are responsible in training its workforce on their construction job site. The city should not lay the money out to pay for them to train the members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in this hearing. I want to thank you for your time and your patience. Uh, your testimony is here, and we will be following up. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Hearings adjourned.